First Voyage of Amerigo Vespucci by Amerigo Vespucci Translated by Clement R. Markham This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Magnificent Lord, I submit humble reverence to you and offer due recommendations. It may be that your magnificence will be astonished at my temerity that I should dare so absurdly to write the present long letter to your magnificence, knowing that your magnificence is constantly occupied in the high councils and affairs touching the lofty republic. And I may be considered not only presumptuous, but also idle in writing things not convenient to your condition, nor agreeable, and written in a barbarous style. But, as I have confidence in your virtues, and in the merit of my writing, which is touching things never before written upon either by ancient or modern writers, as will be seen, I may be excused by your magnificence. The principal thing that moved me to write to you was the request of the bearer, who is named Benvenuto Benvenuti, our Florentine, who is very much the servant of your magnificence, as he tells me, and a great friend of mine. He, finding himself here in the city of Lisbon, requested me to give an account to your magnificence of the things by me seen in different parts of the world during the four voyages that I have made to discover new lands. Two, by order of the Catholic King Ferdinand, by the great gulf of the ocean sea towards the west. The other two, by order of the powerful King Manuel of Portugal, towards the south. He assured me that you will be pleased, and that in this I might hope to serve you. It was this that disposed me to do it, being assured that your magnificence would include me in the number of your servants, remembering how, in the time of our youth, I was your friend, and now your servant, going together to hear the principles of grammar, under the good life and doctrine of the venerable religious friar of St. Mark, Friar Giorgio Antonio Vespucci, whose counsels and doctrine, if it had pleased God that I had followed, I should have been another man from what I am, as Petrarch says. Como do cunque cite, I am not ashamed, because... I have always taken delight in virtuous things. Yet, if these my frivolities are not acceptable to your virtue, I will reflect on what Pliny said to Mycenaeus. Formerly, my witticism used to entertain you. It may be that, though your magnificence is continually occupied with public affairs, you may find an hour of leisure during which you can pass a little time in frivolous or amusing things, and so, as a change from so many occupations, you may read this, my letter, for you may well turn for a brief space from constant care and assiduous thought concerning public affairs. Your magnificence must know that the motive of my coming into this kingdom of Spain was to engage in mercantile pursuits, and that I was occupied in such business for nearly four years, during which I saw and knew various changes of fortune. As these affairs of commerce are uncertain, a man being at one time at the top of the well, and at another fallen and subject to losses, and as the continual labor that a man is exposed to, who would succeed, became evident to me. 
as well as exposure to dangers and failures. I decided upon leaving the mercantile career and upon entering on one that would be more stable and praiseworthy. I was disposed to see some part of the world and its wonders. Time and opportunity offered themselves very conveniently. The King Don Fernando of Castillo, having ordered four ships to be dispatched for the discovery of new lands towards the west, I was chosen by His Highness to go in this fleet to help in the discovery. I left the port of Cadiz on the 10th of May, 1497, and we took our way for the great gulf of the ocean sea, on which voyage I was engaged for eighteen months, discovering a great extent of mainland and an infinite number of islands, most of them inhabited, of which no mention had been made by ancient writers, I believe because they had not any clear information. If I remember rightly, I have read somewhere that this ocean sea was without inhabitants. Our poet Dante was of this opinion, in the 26th chapter of the Inferno, where he treats of the death of Ulysses. In this voyage I saw many wonderful things, as your magnificence will understand. As I said before, we left the port of Cadiz in four ships, and began our navigation to the Fortunate Islands, which are now called the Grand Canaria, situated in the Ocean Sea, on the confines of the inhabited west, within the third climate, over which place the pole rises from the north, above the horizon twenty-seven degrees and a half, and it is distant from this city of Lisbon, 280 leagues between south and southwest. Here we stayed for eight days, providing ourselves with wood, water, and other necessities. From thence, having offered our prayers, we weighed and spread our sails to the wind, shaping our course to the west, with a point to southwest. Our progress was such that at the end of thirty-seven days, we reached land which we judged to be the mainland, being distant from the island of Canaria, more to the west, nearly one thousand leagues, outside that which is inhabited in the torrid zone. For we found the North Pole was above its horizon sixteen degrees, and more to the westward than the island of Canaria, according to the observations with our instruments. We anchored with our ships at a distance of a league and a half from the shore. We got out the boats, and, filled with armed men, we pulled them to the shore. Before we arrived we had seen many men walking along the beach, at which we were much pleased, and we found that they were naked and they showed fear of us, I believe because we were dressed and of a different stature. They all fled to a hill, and, in spite of all the signs of peace and friendship that we made, they would not come to have intercourse with us. As night was coming on and the ship was anchored in a dangerous place, off an open, unsheltered coast, we arranged to get under way the next day, and to go in search of some port or bay where we could make our ships secure. We sailed along the coast to the north, always in sight of land, and the people went along the beach. After two days of navigation we found a very secure place for the ships, and we anchored at a distance of half a league from the land where we saw very many people. We went on shore in the boats on the same day, and forty men in good order landed. The natives were still shy of us, 
and we could not give them sufficient confidence to induce them to come and speak with us. That day we worked so hard with this object by giving them our things, such as bells, looking-glasses, and other trifles, that some of them took courage and came to treat with us. Having established a friendly understanding, as the night was approaching, we took leave of them and returned on board. Next day, at dawn, we saw that there were an immense number of people on the beach, and that they had their women and children with them. We went on shore, and found that they all came laden with their food supplies, which are such as will be described in their place. Before we arrived on shore, many of them swam out to receive us at a crossbow shot's distance, for they are great swimmers, and they showed as much confidence as if we had been having intercourse with them for a long time, and we were pleased at seeing their feelings of security. What we knew of their life and customs was that they all go naked, as well the men as the women, without covering anything, no otherwise than as they come out of their mother's wombs. They are of medium stature and very well proportioned. The color of their skins inclines to red, like the skin of a lion, and I believe that if they were properly clothed, they would be white like ourselves. They have no hair whatsoever on their bodies, but they have very long black hair, especially the women, which beautifies them. They have not very beautiful faces, because they have long eyelids, which make them look like tartars. They do not allow any hair to grow on their eyebrows, nor eyelashes, nor in any other part except on the head, where it is rough and disheveled. They are very agile in their persons, both in walking and running, as well the men as the women and think nothing of running a league or two, as we often witnessed. And in this they have a very great advantage over us Christians. They swim wonderfully well, and the women better than the men, for we have found and seen them many times two leagues at sea, without any help whatever in swimming. Their arms are bows and arrows, well made, except that they have no iron, nor any other kind of hard metal. Instead of iron, they use teeth of animals or of fish, or a bit of wood well burnt at the point. They are sure shots, and where they aim, they hit. In some places, the women use these bows. They have other weapons, like lances, hardened by fire, and clubs with the knobs very well carved. They wage war among themselves with people who do not speak their language, carrying it on with great cruelty, giving no quarter, if not inflicting greater punishment. When they go to war, they take their women with them, not because they fight, but because they carry the provisions in rear of the men. A woman carries a burden on her back, which a man would not carry, for thirty or forty leagues, as we have seen many times. They have no leader, nor do they march in any order, no one being captain. The cause of their wars is not the desire of rule, nor to extend the limits of their dominions but owing to some ancient feud that has arisen among them in former times. When asked why they made war, they have no other answer than that it is to avenge the death of their ancestors and their fathers. They have neither king nor lord, nor do they obey anyone, but live in freedom. 
having moved themselves to wage war, when the enemy have killed or captured any of them, the oldest relation arises and goes preaching through the streets and calling upon his countrymen to come with him to avenge the death of his relation, and thus he moves them by compassion. They do not bring men to justice nor punish a criminal. Neither the mother nor the father chastise their children, and it is wonderful that we never saw a quarrel among them. They show themselves simple in their talk, and are very sharp and cunning in securing their ends. They speak little and in a low voice. They use the same accents as ourselves, forming their words either on the palate, the teeth, or the lips, only they have other words for things. Great is the diversity of languages, for in a hundred leagues we found such changes in the language that the inhabitants could not understand each other. Their mode of life is very barbarous, for they have no regular time for their meals, but they eat at any time that they have the wish, as often at night as in the day. Indeed, they eat at all hours. They take their food on the ground, without napkin or any other cloth, eating out of earthen pots which they make, or out of half calabashes. They sleep in certain very large nets made of cotton, and suspended in the air. And if this should seem a bad way of sleeping, I say that it is pleasant to sleep in that manner, and that we slept better in that way than in coverlets. They are a people of cleanly habits as regards their bodies, and are constantly washing themselves. When they empty the stomach, they do everything so as not to be seen, and in this they are clean and decent. But in making water, they are dirty and without shame, for while talking with us, they do such things without turning round and without any shame. They do not practice matrimony among them, each man taking as many women as he likes, and when he is tired of a woman, he repudiates her without either injury to himself or shame to the woman. For in this matter the woman has the same liberty as the man. They are not very jealous, but lascivious beyond measure, the women much more so than the men. I do not further refer to their contrivances for satisfying their inordinate desires, so that I may not offend against modesty. They are very prolific in bearing children, and in their pregnancy they are not excused any work whatever. The parturition is so easy, and accompanied by so little pain, that they are up and about the next day. They go to some river to wash, and presently are quite well, appearing on the water like fish. If they are angry with their husbands, they easily cause abortion with certain poisonous herbs or roots, and destroy the child. Many infants perish in this way. They are gifted with very handsome and well-proportioned bodies, and no part or member is to be seen that is not well formed. Although they go naked, yet that which should be concealed is kept between the thighs so that it cannot be seen. Yet there no one cares, for the same impression is made on them at seeing anything indecent as is made on us at seeing a nose or mouth. Among them, it is considered strange if a woman has wrinkles on the bosom from frequent parturition, or on the belly. All parts are invariably preserved after the parturition as they were before. They showed an excessive desire for our company. 
We did not find that these people had any laws. They cannot be called Moors, nor Jews, but worse than Gentiles. For we did not see that they offered any sacrifices, nor have they any place of worship. I judge their lives to be Epicurean. Their habitations are in common. Their dwellings are like huts, but strongly built of very large trees, and covered with palm leaves, secure from tempests and winds. In some places they are of such length and width that we found six hundred souls in one single house. We found villages of only thirteen houses, where there were four thousand inhabitants. They build the villages every eight or ten years, and, when asked why they did this, they replied that it was because the soil was corrupted and infected, and caused disease in their bodies, so they chose a new site. Their wealth consists of the feathers of birds of many colors, or paternosters made of the fins of fishes, or of white or green stones, which they wear on their necks, lips, and ears, and of many other things which have no value for us. They have no commerce, and neither buy nor sell. In conclusion, they live, and are content with what nature has given them. They have none of the riches which are looked upon as such in our Europe, and in other parts, such as gold, pearls, or precious stones. And even if they have them in their country, they do not work to get them. They are liberal in their giving, for it is wonderful if they refuse anything, and also liberal in asking, as soon as they make friends. Their greatest sign of friendship is to give their wives or daughters, and a father and mother consider themselves highly honored when they brought us a daughter, especially if she was a virgin, that we should sleep with her, and in doing this they use terms of warm friendship. When they die, they use several kinds of burial. Some bury their dead with water and food, thinking they will want it. They have no ceremonies of lights, nor of weeping. In some other places they practice a most barbarous and inhuman kind of interment. This is that when a sick or infirm person is almost in the throes of death, his relations carry him into a great wood, and fasten one of those nets in which they sleep to two trees. They put their dying relation into it, and dance round him the whole of one day. When night comes on, they put water and food, enough for four or six days at his head, and then leave him alone, returning to their village. If the sick man can help himself, and eats and lives so as to return to the village, they receive him with ceremony, but few are those who escape. Most of them die, and that is their sepulchre. They have many other customs, which are omitted to avoid prolixity. In their illnesses they use various kinds of medicines, so different from ours that we marveled how anyone escaped. I often saw a patient ill with fever when the disease was at its height, bathed with quantities of cold water from head to foot. Then they made a great fire all round, making him turn backwards and forwards for two hours until he was tired, and he was then left to sleep, Many were cured. They also attend to the diet, keep the patient without food, and draw blood, not from the arm, 
but from the thighs and loins, and from the calves of the legs. They also provoke vomiting by putting one of their herbs into the mouth, and they use many other remedies which it would take long to recount. They abound much in phlegm and in blood on account of their food, which consists of roots, fruit, and fish. They have no sowing of grain, nor of any kind of corn. But for their common use, they eat the root of a tree, from which they make very good flour, and they call it yuca. Others call it kazabi and ignami. They eat little flesh, unless it be human flesh. And your magnificence must know that they are so inhuman as to transgress regarding this most bestial custom. For they eat all their enemies that they kill or take, as well females as males, with so much barbarity that it is a brutal thing to mention how much more to see it, as has happened to me an infinite number of times. They were astonished at us when we told them that we did not eat our enemies. Your magnificence may believe for certain that they have many other barbarous customs, for in these four voyages I have seen so many things different from our customs that I have written a book to be called the four voyages, in which I have related the greater part of the things I saw very clearly and to the best of my abilities. I have not yet published it, because my own affairs are in such a bad state that I have no taste for what I have written, yet I am much inclined to publish it. In this work will be seen all the events in detail. I therefore do not enlarge upon them here. For in the course of the said work we shall see many other special details. So this will suffice for what is general. In this beginning I did not see anything of much value in the land, except some indications of gold. I believe that this was because we did not know the language, and so we could not benefit by the resources of the land. We resolved to depart, and to proceed onwards, coasting along the land, in which voyage we made many tacks, and had intercourse with many tribes. At the end of certain days we came to a port where we were in the greatest danger, and it pleased the Lord to save us. It was in this way. We went on shore in a port where we found a village built over a lake, like Venice. There were about forty-four large houses founded on very thick piles, and each had a drawbridge leading to the door. From one house there was a way to all the rest by drawbridges, which led from house to house. The people of this little city showed signs that they were afraid of us, and suddenly they rose all at once. While looking at this wonder, we saw about twenty-two canoes coming over the sea, which are the sort of boats they use hollowed out of a single tree. They came to our ships as if to gaze with wonder at us and our clothes, but they kept at a distance. Things being so, we made signs to them to come to us, giving them assurances of friendship. Seeing that they did not come, we went to them, but they did not wait for us. They went on shore, and made signs to us that we should wait, and that they would soon return. They went straight to a hill, and were not long before they came back, 
leading with them sixteen of their young girls. They got into the canoes and came to the ships, and in each ship they put four, and we were as much surprised at such a proceeding as your magnificence will be. They were amongst our ships with the canoes, speaking with us. We looked upon this as a sign of friendship. Presently, a number of people came swimming over the sea and approached us without our feeling any suspicion whatever, having come from the houses. Then certain old women appeared at the doors of the houses, uttering great cries and tearing their hair in sign of grief. This made us suspect something, and each man seized his arms. Suddenly the young girls who were on board jumped into the sea, and those in the canoes came nearer and began to shoot with their bows and arrows. Those who were swimming had each brought a lance, concealed under the water as much as possible. As soon as we understood the treachery, we not only defended ourselves from them, but also attacked them vigorously and sank many of their canoes with our ships. Thus we routed and slaughtered them, and all took to swimming, abandoning their canoes. Having thus suffered enough damage, they swam to the land. Nearly fifteen or twenty of them were killed, and many were wounded. Of our men, five were wounded, and all escaped, thanks to God. We captured two girls and two men. We went to their houses and entered them, but only found two old women and one sick man. We took many of their things, but they were of little value. We would not burn their houses because we felt compunctions of conscience. We returned to our ships with five prisoners, and put irons on the feet of each, except the girls. On the following night the two girls and one of the men escaped with great cunning. Next day we decided upon continuing our course onwards. We sailed constantly along the coast, and came to another tribe, distant about eighty leagues from the one we had left, and very different both as regards language and customs. We came to an anchor, and went on shore in the boats, when we saw that a great number of people were on the beach, upwards of four thousand souls. They did not wait for our landing, but took to flight, abandoning their things. We jumped on shore and went along a road which led to the woods. At the distance of a crossbow shot, we found their huts, where they had made very large fires, and two were there cooking their food and roasting animals and fish of many sorts. Here we saw that they were roasting a certain animal like a serpent, except that it had no wings, and its appearance was so horrid that many of us wondered at its fierceness. We walked to their houses or sheds, and they had many of these serpents alive, fastened by their feet and with a cord round the snout, so that they could not open their mouths, as is done to pointers, to prevent them from biting. Their aspect was so fierce that none of us dared to go near one, thinking they were poisonous. They are the size of a young goat, and a fathom and a half long. They have long and thick feet, armed with large claws, the skin hard and of various colors. The mouth and face are like those of a serpent. They have a crest like a saw, which extends from the nose to the end of the tail. We concluded that they were serpents and poisonous, yet they eat them. 
we found that the natives made bread of small fishes, which they take from the sea, first boiling them, then pounding them into a paste, and roasting them in the cinders, and so they are eaten. We tried them and found them good. They have so many other kinds of food, and a greater number of fruits and roots, that it would take long to describe them in detail. Seeing that the people did not come back, we determined not to touch any of their things, to give them more confidence. We also left many of our own things in their huts, that they might see them, and at night we returned to the ships. Next day, at dawn, we saw an immense crowd of people on the beach, so we went on shore. When they again showed fear, we reassured them and induced them to treat with us, giving them everything they asked for. When they became friendly, they told us that those were their habitations, and that they were come to fish. They asked us to come to their villages, that they might receive us as friends. They showed such friendship because of the two men we had prisoners, who were their enemies. Seeing their importunity, and after a consultation, we decided that twenty-eight of our Christians, in good order, should go with them, with the firm intention to die if it should be necessary. When we had been there nearly three days, we went with them into the interior. At a distance of three leagues from the beach, we came to a village of few houses and many inhabitants, there not being more than nine habitations. Here we were received with so many barbarous ceremonies that the pen will not suffice to write them down. There were songs, dances, tears mingled with rejoicings, and plenty of food. We remained here for the night. Here they offered their wives to us, and we were unable to defend ourselves from them. We remained all night and half the next day. The multitude of people who came to see us was such that they could not be counted. The older men prayed that we would come with them to another village further in the interior, making signs that they would show us the greatest honor. So we agreed to go, and it cannot be expressed what great honor they showed us. We came to many villages and were nine days on the journey, so that our Christians who remained on board became anxious about us. Being nearly eighteen leagues inland, in a direct line, we determined to return to the ships. On the return journey, the crowd was so great that came with us to the beach, both of men and women, that it was wonderful. If any of our people got tired on the way, they carried them in their nets very comfortably. In crossing the rivers, which are numerous and very large, they took us across by their contrivances so safely that there was no danger whatever. Many of them came laden with the things they had given to us, which were their sleeping nets, most of them richly worked. Numerous parrots of various colors, many bows and arrows, while others carried burdens consisting of their provisions and animals. What greater wonder can I tell you than that they thought themselves fortunate when, in passing a river, they could carry us on their backs? Having reached the shore, we went on board the ships. They made such a crowd to enter our ships in order to see them that we were astonished. 
we took as many as we could in the boats, and took them to the ships, and so many came swimming that we were inclined to stop such a crowd from being on board, more than a thousand souls, all naked and without arms. They wondered at our arrangements and contrivances, and at the size of the ships. There happened a laughable thing, which was that we had occasion to fire off some of our artillery, and when the report was heard, the greater part of the natives on board jumped overboard from fear, and began to swim like the frogs on the banks, which, when they are frightened, jump into the swamp. Such was the conduct of these people. Those who remained on board were so frightened that we were sorry we had done it, but we reassured them by saying that we frightened our enemies with those arms. Having amused themselves all day on board, we told them that they must go, because we wished to depart that night. And so they went away with much show of love and friendship, returning to the shore. Among this tribe, and in their land, I knew and saw so much of their customs and mode of life that I do not care to enlarge upon them here. For your magnificence must know that in each of my voyages I have noted down the most remarkable things, and all is reduced into a volume in the geographical style, entitled The Four Voyages in which work all things are described in detail, but I have not yet sent out a copy because it is necessary for me to revise it. This land is very populous and full of people, with numerous rivers but few animals. They are similar to ours except the lions, ounces, stags, pigs, goats, and deer and these still have some differences of form. They have neither horses nor mules, asses nor dogs, nor any kind of sheep nor cattle. But they have many other animals, all wild, and none of them serve for any domestic use, so that they cannot be counted. What shall we say of the birds, which are so many, and of so many kinds and colors of plumage, that it is wonderful to see them. The land is very pleasant and fruitful, full of very large woods and forests, and it is always green, for the trees never shed their leaves. The fruits are so numerous that they cannot be enumerated, and all different from ours. This land is within the torrid zone, under the parallel which the Tropic of Cancer describes, where the pole is 23 degrees above the horizon, on the verge of the second climate. Many people came to see us, and were astonished at our appearance and the whiteness of our skins. They asked whence we came, and we gave them to understand that we came from heaven, and that we were traveling to see the world, and they believed it. In this land we put up a font of baptism, and an infinite number of people were baptized, and they called us, in their language, Karabi, which is as much as to say, men of great wisdom. We departed from this port. The province is called Parias, and we navigated along the coast, always in sight of land, until we had run along it a distance of 870 leagues, always toward the northwest, making many tacks and treating with many tribes. In many places we discovered gold, though not in any great quantity, but we did much in discovering the land and in ascertaining that there was gold. 
we had now been thirteen months on the voyage, and the ships and gear were much worn, and the men tired. We resolved, after consultation, to beach the ships and heave them down, as they were making much water, and to caulk them afresh, before shaping a course for Spain. When we made this decision we were near the finest harbor in the world, which we entered with our ships. Here we found a great many people, who received us in a very friendly manner. On shore we made a bastion with our boats and with casks and our guns, at which we all rejoiced. Here we lightened and cleared our ships, and hauled them up, making all the repairs that were necessary, the people of the country giving us all manner of help, and regularly supplying us with provisions. For in that port we had little relish for our own, which we made fun of, for our provisions for the voyage were running short and were bad. We remained here thirty-seven days, and often went to their village, where they received us with great honor. When we wanted to resume our voyage, they made a complaint how, at certain times, a very cruel and hostile tribe came by way of the sea to their land, murdered many of them, subdued them, and took some prisoners, carrying them off to their own houses and land. They added that they were scarcely able to defend themselves, making signs that their enemies were people of an island at a distance of about one hundred leagues out at sea. They said this so earnestly that we believed them, and we promised to avenge their injuries, which gave them much pleasure. Many of them offered to go with us, but we did not wish to take them. We agreed that seven should accompany us, on condition that they went in their own canoe, for we did not want to be obliged to take them back to their land, and they were content. So we took leave of those people, leaving many friends among them. Our ships having been repaired, we navigated for seven days across the sea, with the wind between northeast and east, and at the end of the seven days we came upon the islands, which were numerous, some inhabited and others deserted. We anchored off one of them, where we saw many people, who called it Eti. Having manned our boats with good men, and placed three rounds of the bombard in each, we pulled to the shore, where we found four hundred men and many women, all naked. They were well made, and seemed good fighting men, for they were armed with bows and arrows, and lances. The greater part of them also had square shields, and they carried them so that they should not impede their using the bow. As we approached the shore in the boats, at the distance of a bow-shot, they all rushed into the water to shoot their arrows, and to defend themselves from us, they returned to the land. They all had their bodies painted with different colors, and were adorned with feathers. The interpreters told us that, when they showed themselves plumed and painted, it is a sign that they intend to fight. They so persevered in defending the landing that we were obliged to use our artillery. When they heard the report and saw some of their own people fall dead, they all retreated in inland. After holding a consultation, we resolved to land forty of our men and await their attack. The men landed with their arms, and the natives came against us and fought us for nearly an hour, gaining little advantage, except that our crossbowmen and gunners killed some of the natives, while 
they wounded some of our people. They would not wait for the thrust of our spears or swords, but we pushed on with such vigor at last that we came within sword thrust, and as they could not withstand our arms, they fled to the hills and woods, leaving us victorious on the field with many of their dead and wounded. We did not continue the pursuit that day because we were very tired. In returning to the ships, the seven men who came with us showed such delight that they could not contain themselves. Next day, we saw a great number of the people on shore, still with signs of war, sounding horns and various other instruments used by them for defiance, and all plumed and painted, so that it was a very strange thing to behold them. All the ships, therefore, consulted together, and it was concluded that these people desired hostility with us. It was then decided that we should do all in our power to make friends with them, and, if they rejected our friendship, we should treat them as enemies, and that we should make slaves of as many as we could take. Being armed as well as our means admitted, we returned to the shore. They did not oppose our landing, I believe from fear of the guns. Forty of our men landed in four detachments, each with a captain, and attacked them. After a long battle, many of them being killed, the rest were put to flight. We followed in pursuit until we came to a village having taken nearly 250 prisoners. We burnt the village and returned to the ships with these 250 prisoners, leaving many killed and wounded. On our side, no more than one was killed, and 22 were wounded, who all recovered. God be thanked. We prepared to depart, and the seven men, five of whom were wounded, took a canoe belonging to the island, and with seven prisoners that we gave them, four women and three men, they returned to their land with much joy, astonished at our power. We made sail for Spain with 222 prisoners, 85 our slaves, and arrived in the port of Cadiz on the 15th of October, 1498, where we were well received, and where we sold our slaves. This is what befell me in this my first voyage, that was most worthy of note. The First Voyage Ends End of First Voyage of Amerigo Vespucci By Amerigo Vespucci Translated by Clement R. Markham Recording by Pneumatic Also known as Vincent V. Marshburn Second Voyage of Amerigo Vespucci By Amerigo Vespucci Translated by Clement R. Markham. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As regards the second voyage, what I saw in it most worthy of mention is as follows. We left the port of Cadiz, with three ships, on the 16th of May, 1499, and shaped our course direct for the Cape Verde Islands, passing in sight of the island of Grand Canary. And we navigated until we reached an island which is called the Island of Fuoco. Here we got in our supplies of wood and water, and 
thence shaped our course to the southwest. In forty-four days we came in sight of a new land, and we judged it to be the mainland, continuous with that of which mention has already been made. This land is within the torrid zone, and beyond the equinoctial line on the south side, over which the pole rises from the meridian five degrees, beyond every climate. It is distant from the said islands by the southwest wind five hundred leagues. We found the day and night to be equal, because we arrived on the 27th of June, when the sun is near the Tropic of Cancer. We found this land to be all drowned and full of very great rivers. At first we did not see any people. We anchored our ships and got our boats out, going with them to the land which, as I have said, we found to be full of very large rivers and drowned by these great rivers. There we tried in many directions to see if we could enter, and, owing to the great waters and rivers, in spite of so much labor, we could not find a place that was not inundated. We saw, along the rivers, many signs of the country being inhabited. But having ascertained that we could not enter from this part, we determined to return to the ships and to try another part. We weighed our anchors and navigated between the east-southeast, coasting along the land, which trended southwards, and many times we made forty leagues, but all was time lost. We found on this coast that the current of the sea had such force that it prevented us from navigating, for it ran from south to north. The inconvenience was so great for our navigation that, after a consultation, we decided upon altering the course to north, and we made good such a distance along the land that we reached a most excellent port, formed by a large island, which was at the entrance. Within, a very large haven was formed. In sailing along the island to enter it, we saw many people, and we steered our ships so as to bring them up where the people were seen, which was nearly four leagues more towards the sea. Sailing in this way, we had seen a canoe, which was coming from seaward with many people on board. We determined to overhaul her, and we went round with our ships in her direction so that we might not lose her. Sailing towards the canoe with a fresh breeze, we saw that they had stopped with their oars tossed, I believe with wonder at the sight of our ships. But when they saw that we were gaining upon them, they put down their oars and began to row towards the land. As our company came in a fast-sailing caravel of forty-five tons, we got to windward of the canoe, and when it seemed time to bear down upon her, the sheets were eased off so as to come near her. And as the caravel seemed to be coming down upon her, and those on board did not wish to be caught, they pulled away to leeward, and, seeing their advantage, they gave way with their oars to escape. As we had our boats at the stern well manned, we thought we should catch the canoe. The boats chased for more than two hours, and, at last, the caravel made another tack, but could not fetch the canoe. As the people in the canoe saw they were closely pressed by the caravel and the boats, they all jumped into the sea, their number being about seventy men, the distance from the shore being nearly two leagues. Following them in the boats during the whole day, 
we were unable to capture more than two, all the rest escaping on shore. Only four boys remained in the canoe, who were not part of their tribe, but prisoners from some other land. They had been castrated, and were all without the virile member, and with the scars fresh, at which we wondered much. Having taken them on board, they told us by signs that they had been castrated to be eaten. We then knew that the people in the canoe belonged to the tribe called Kambali, very fierce men who eat human flesh. We came with the ship, towing the canoe astern, approaching the land and anchored at a distance of half a league. We saw a great number of people on the beach, so we went on shore with the boats, taking with us the two men we had captured. When we came near, all the people fled into the woods. So we released one of our prisoners, giving him many signs that we wanted to be their friends. He did what we wanted very well, and brought back all the people with him, numbering about four hundred men and many women, and they came unarmed to the boats. A good understanding was established with them. We released the other prisoner, sent to the ships for their canoe, and restored it to them. This canoe was twenty-six passes long, and two braccia in width, all dug out of a single tree, and very well worked. When they had hauled it up and put it in a secure place, they all fled, and would not have anything more to do with us, which seemed a barbarous act, and we judged them to be a faithless and ill-conditioned people. We saw a little gold, which they wear in their ears. We departed and entered the bay, where we found so many people that it was wonderful. We made friends with them, and many of us went with them to their villages in great security. In this place we collected 150 pearls, which they gave us for a small bell and a little gold was given to us for nothing. In this land we found that they drank wine made from their fruits and seeds, like beer, both white and red. The best was made from plums, and it was very good. We ate a great many of them, as they were in season. It is a very good fruit, pleasant to the taste, and wholesome for the body. The land abounds in their articles of food, and the people are of good manners, and the most peaceful we have yet met with. We were seventeen days in this port, enjoying it very much, and every day new people from the interior came to see us, wondering at our faces and the whiteness of our skins, at our clothes and arms, and at the shape and size of our ships. From these people we had tidings that there was another tribe to the westward who were their enemies, and who had an immense quantity of pearls. Those which they possessed had been taken in their wars. They told us how they were fished, and in what manner the pearls were born, and we found their information to be correct, as your magnificence will hear. We left this port, and sailed along the coast, always seeing people on the beach, and at the end of many days we came to, in a port, by reason of the necessity for repairing one of our ships, which made much water. Here we found many people, but were unable, either by force or persuasion, 
to establish any intercourse with them. When we went on shore, they opposed the landing fiercely, and when they could do no more, they fled into the woods and did not wait for us. Seeing that they were such barbarians, we departed thence, and, sailing onwards, we came in sight of an island which was fifteen leagues from the land. We decided upon going to see whether it was inhabited. We found on it the most bestial and the most brutal race that has ever been seen, and they were of this kind. They were very brutish in appearance and gesture, and they had their mouths full of the leaves of a green herb, which they continually chewed like beasts, so that they could hardly speak. And each had round his neck two dry gourds, one full of that herb which they had in their mouths, and the other of white flour that appeared to be powdered lime. From time to time they put in the powder with a spindle, which they kept wet in the mouth. Then they put stuff into their mouths from both, powdering the herb already in use. They did this with much elaboration, and the thing seemed wonderful, for we could not understand the secret, or with what object they did it. These people, when they saw us, came to us with much familiarity, as if we had formed friendship with them. Walking with them on the beach and talking, being desirous of drinking fresh water, they made signs that they had none, and offered their herb and powder, from which we concluded that the island was ill provided with water, and that they kept this herb in their mouths to keep off thirst. We walked over the island for a day and a half, without finding a spring of water, and we saw that the water they drank was what had fallen during the night on certain leaves, which looked like asses' ears, and held the water, and of this they drank. It was excellent water, and these leaves are not found in many places. They have no kind of meat, and no roots, as on the mainland. They were sustained by fish caught in the sea, of which they had great abundance, and they were very good fishermen. They gave us many turtles, and many large and excellent fish. Their women did not have the herb in their mouths, like the men, but they all carried a gourd with water, from which they drank. They have no villages nor houses, but merely live under bowers of leaves, which shade them from the sun, though not from the rain. But I believe that it seldom rains on that island. When they are fishing out at sea, they all have a very large leaf, and of such width that it forms a shade. As the sun rises, so they raise the leaf, and thus they protect themselves from the sun. The island contains many animals of various sorts, and much water in swamps, and seeing that it offered no profit whatever, we departed and went to another island. We found that this other island was inhabited by very tall people. We landed to see whether there was any fresh water, and, not thinking it was inhabited, as we had not seen anyone, we came upon very large footmarks in the sand as we were walking along the beach. We judged that if the other measurements were in proportion to those of their feet, they must be very tall. Going in search, we came into a road which led inland. There were nine of us. 
Judging that there could not be many inhabitants, as the island was small, we walked over it to see what sort of people they were. When we had gone about a league, we saw five huts, which appeared to be uninhabited, in a valley, and we went to them. But we only found five women, two old, and three children of such lofty stature that, for the wonder of the thing, we wanted to keep them. When they saw us, they were so frightened that they had not the power to run away. The two old women began to invite us with words, and to set before us many things, and took us into a hut. They were taller than a large man, who may well be tall, such as was Francesco Degli Albizi, but better proportioned. Our intention was to take the young girls by force, and to bring them to Castile, as a wonderful thing. While we were forming this design, there entered by the door of the hut as many as thirty-six men, much bigger than the women, and so well made that it was a rare thing to behold them. They, in like manner, put us into such a state of perturbation that we rather wished we were on board than having dealings with such people. They carried very large bows and arrows and great clubs with knobs. They talked among themselves in a tone as if they wished to destroy us. Seeing ourselves in such danger, we made various suggestions one to another. Some proposed that we should attack them in the hut, and others said that it would be better to do so outside while others advised that we should not take any action until we saw what the natives were going to do. We at last agreed to go out of the hut and walk away in the direction of the ships as if nothing had happened, and this we did. Having taken our route to return to the ships, they also came along behind us at a distance of about a stone's throw, talking among themselves. I believe they had not less fear of us than we of them, for sometimes we stopped to rest, and they did so also without coming nearer. At last we came to the beach, where the boats were waiting for us. We got in, and when we were some away from the shore, the natives rushed down and shot many arrows. But we then had little fear of them. We replied with two bombard shots, more to frighten them than to do them harm. They all fled into the woods, and so we took leave of them, thankful to escape after a dangerous adventure. They all went naked like the others. We called this island the Island of the Giants, by reason of their stature. We proceeded onwards along the coast, and there happened to be combats with the natives many times, because they did not wish us to take anything from the land. At length we became desirous of returning to Castile, having been on the sea for nearly a year and the provisions being nearly exhausted, the little that remained being damaged by the heat. For from the time that we left the islands of Cape Verde until now, we had been continually navigating within the torrid zone, and twice we had crossed the equinoctial line. For, as I said before, we went five degrees beyond it to the south, and now we were in fifteen degrees to the north. Being in this state of mind, it pleased the Holy Spirit to give us some rest from our great hardships. 
for as we were searching for a port in which to repair our ships, we came upon a people who received us with much friendship. We found that they had a very great quantity of oriental pearls, and exceedingly good ones. We stayed with them forty-seven days, and obtained from them one hundred nineteen marks of pearls for very little merchandise in exchange. I believe the pearls did not cost us the value of forty ducats. What we gave them was nothing but bells and looking-glasses and beads and ten bells and tin foil. For one bell a native gave all the pearls he had. Here we learnt how they fished for them, and where, and they gave us many shells in which they are born. We bartered for a shell in which were born one hundred thirty pearls, and in others less. This one of one hundred thirty the queen took, and others I put aside that they might not be seen. Your magnificence must know that if the pearls are not mature, and are not detached, they soon perish, and of this I have had experience. When they are mature, they are detached in the shell, and are placed among the flesh. These are good. When they were bad, the greater part were cracked and badly bored. Nevertheless, they are worth a good deal of money when sold in the market. At the end of forty-seven days, we took leave of these very friendly natives. We departed, and, for the sake of obtaining many things of which we were in need, we shaped a course for the island of Antiglia, being that which Christopher Columbus discovered a few years ago. Here we took many supplies on board, and remained two months and seventeen days. Here we endured many dangers and troubles from the same Christians who were in this island with Columbus. I believe this was caused by envy. But, to avoid prolixity, I will refrain from recounting what happened. We departed from the said island on the 22nd of July, and, after a voyage of a month and a half, we entered the port of Cadiz on the 8th of September, being my second voyage. God be praised. End of the Second Voyage End of Second Voyage of Amerigo Vespucci by Amerigo Vespucci Translated by Clement R. Markham Recording by Pneumatic Also known as Vincent V. Marshburn Atlantis, from the Encyclopaedia Britannica, 11th edition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in February 2023. Atlantis. Atlantis, or Atlantica, a legendary island in the Atlantic Ocean, first mentioned by Plato in the Timaeus. Plato describes how certain Egyptian priests, in a conversation with Solon, represented the island as a country larger than Asia Minor and Libya united, and situated just beyond the Pillars of Hercules, Straits of Gibraltar. Beyond it lay an archipelago of lesser islands. According to the priests, Atlantis had been a powerful kingdom 9,000 years before the birth of Solon, and its armies had overrun the lands which bordered the Mediterranean. Athens alone had withstood them with success. Finally, the sea had overwhelmed Atlantis, and had thenceforward become unnavigable owing to the shoals which marked the spot. 
In the Critias, Plato adds a history of the ideal commonwealth of Atlantis. It is impossible to decide how far this legend is due to Plato's invention and how far it is based on facts of which no record remains. Medieval writers, for whom the tale was preserved by the Arabian geographers, believed it true and were fortified in their belief by numerous traditions of islands in the western sea which offered various points of resemblance to Atlantis. Such in particular were the Greek islands of the blessed, or fortunate islands, the Welsh Avalon, the Portuguese Antilia, or Isle of Seven Cities, and St. Brendan's Island, the subject of many sagas in many languages. These, which are described in separate articles, helped to maintain the tradition of an earthly paradise which had become associated with the myth of Atlantis, and all except Avalon were marked in maps of the 14th and 15th centuries and formed the objects of voyages of discovery, in one case, St. Brendan's Island, until the 18th century. In early legends, of whatever nationality, they are almost invariably described in terms which closely resemble Homer's account of the island of the Phaeacians, Odyssey Book Eight, a fact which may be an indication of their common origin in some folk tale current among several races. Somewhat similar legends are those of the island of Brazil, of Lyonnais, the sunken land off the Cornish coast, of the lost Brighton city of Is, and of Maida or Asmaid, the French Ile Verde and Portuguese Ilha Verde or Green Island which appears in many folk tales from Gibraltar to the Hebrides, and until 1853 was marked on English charts as a rock in 44 degrees 48 minutes north and 26 degrees 10 minutes west. After the Renaissance, with its renewal of interest in platonic studies, numerous attempts were made to rationalize the myth of Atlantis. The island was variously identified with America, Scandinavia, the Canaries, and even Palestine. Ethnologists saw in its inhabitants the ancestors of the Guanchos, the Basques, or the ancient Italians, and even in the 17th and 18th centuries, the credibility of the whole legend was seriously debated, and sometimes admitted, even by Montaigne, Buffon, and Voltaire. For the theory that Atlantis is to be identified with Crete in the Minoan period, see The Lost Continent in The London Times for the 19th of February 1909. See also Dissertation sur l'Atlantide in T. H. Martin's Etude sur la Timée, 1841. End of Atlantis from the Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition. The Civilization of Japan by Liang Kachao from Gems of Chinese Literature Translated by Herbert Allen Giles This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The reception of foreign learning by the Chinese people differs from its reception by the Japanese. Japan is a small country and, moreover, possesses no learning which is really its own. Therefore, if such learning arrives from without, the Japanese rush to it, as though on galloping horses, change as rapidly as an echo follows sound, and in the twinkling of an eye the whole nation is transformed. However, a careful estimate of their capacity shows that they are really nothing more than mere imitators. They are in no sense able to add anything of their own, or anything they may have themselves initiated. Now China is not like that. China is a huge country, with a learning of its own, which has been handed down for several thousand years, and which is so well fortified by defences that foreign ideas do not easily find their way in. Even if they do get in, for many, perhaps a hundred years, their influence will not succeed in rumpling the hair of one's head. It is like throwing ink into water. If the water is a foot-wide bowl, or in a ten-foot pool, the ink will very rapidly discolour it all. But if the same ink is thrown into a mighty rushing river, or into the wide and deep ocean, can these be easily stained in the same way? Again, although China is not receptive of foreign learning, from what she does receive she makes a point of extracting all the excellences and adapting these to her own advantage. She transmutes the substance and etherealizes its use, thus producing a new factor of civilization 
which is altogether her own. Her blue is thus bluer than the indigo blue of the foreigners. Her ice is colder than their water. Ah, me. Deep mountains and wide marshes give birth indeed to dragons, but the footprints of our noble representative can never be familiar to the small-sized gentlemen of the country of dwarves. End of The Civilization of Japan by Liang Kachao Read by Alistair The Country and People of the Kurds by Helmut von Moltke from Essays, Speeches and Memoirs of Field Marshal Count Helmut von Moltke, translated by Charles Flint McCumper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Country and People of the Kurds Those who are interested in the denouement of the tragedy in the East will be surprised to hear a report of new risings in Kurdistan, at the moment when everybody believed the affairs of the Turkish Empire settled by the interference of the four great European powers. And yet the insurrection is only a consequence of this interference. With the Battle of Nasib, the sovereignty of the Padishah over the newly defeated Kurds, who, however, were never completely subdued, had ceased. We felt we had no power over the mountain tribes, and so they were left alone. But now that English and Austrian cannon have left the port free to act, she demands as before, taxes and corvée, money and recruits, and thus causes the insurrection, which must come before long, even if it is not broken out already. The phenomenon reminds us of a mighty stream, which flows onwards with unruffled surface, until it is opposed by rocks, when it reveals for the first time, by the surging and roaring of its waters, the force with which it moves. The province had already renounced its allegiance, and the first attempt to recover it called forth open insurrection. In giving a short sketch of the people and the country, which at the present moment may well attract the eyes of all Europe, we will not begin with Xenophon, but simply mention that the Cardouches are to this day the terror of all intruders, and that they still construct those houses with little towers, of which the Greek general tells us. We will not vainly attempt to clear up the long and dark history of this people, nor stay to inquire whether they are a tribe of Tartar immigrants, or the descendants of the old Medes and Chaldeans, whose language is preserved in the Bibles of those villages on the Persian frontier which have remained Christian. We wish, rather, to describe the Kurds and their home, as they appear today to observers, who had an opportunity of spending some time amongst them, travellers who, ignorant of the language, and surrounded by a thousand dangers real and imaginary, hurried over these mountains by the perilous passes of Bitlis and Ajin Lameric. If any nation is bound to the soil, it is the Kurds. Heirs of an ancient agriculture, they live in the valleys of the Armenian tableland, shunning the plains where the brooks of their native mountains are dried up, and though the winters are severe, they enjoy long beautiful summers. Among them are a few wandering shepherds, but for the most part they are an essentially agricultural people, to this extent nomadic, that when the heat in the valleys becomes oppressive, and the rays of the sun free the mountain pastures from the snow, they drive their herds a step higher, for a time exchanging their houses for tents of black goat hair. Quite in accordance with this manner of life is the fact that in the district inhabited by them we find nothing but villages, detached farms are nowhere to be seen, nor yet towns of any size. The latter are not in Kurdistan, but around it. If a line be drawn from Dia Bakir, cutting through Mardin, Nizibin, Jessera ibn Omar, Van, Mush, Palu, Derinde, Marish, and Adiaman, it will encircle Kurdistan proper, in the interior of which only very small towns such as Tako, Bitlis, Sort, Hasukefa, Thiro, Portek, Troglu, etc. are to be found. The population of these is principally Kurdish, and it is only in the plains of Kaput and Malatya that we find two towns with these names. Places of importance, it is true, but decidedly not Kurdish. In all these towns is a wonderful mixture of nations, languages and religions. The Christians, the older part of the population, are descendants of the ancient Assyrians and Chaldeans, mixed with Armenians who immigrated at a later period. The former are for the greater part Jacobites and Nestorians, who were sharply divided by the difference of their opinions. The latter, with the exception of some proselytes gained by the propaganda at Rome and St. Lazaro of Venice, belong to the Greek church. These Christians intermarried with the neighbouring Kurds, and over the population thus formed, passed the wave of Saracens, which the Crusaders were here compelled to resist, leaving a sediment everywhere, behind it of greater or less amount. Finally the Turks obtained supremacy, and the Jews, who are distributed over the world as universally as iron, are not wanting. In the south, the home of the Kurds is sharply bounded by the mountains. Beyond their range, the Arab villages cease. 
agriculture is unknown, and it is only in a few walled towns that the inhabitants are safe from Arab raids. The Kurds who inhabit the Sinshar Mountains form an isolated outpost. This mountain chain rises steep and warlike from the immense steppe of Mesopotamia. In the north and east, however, the Kurds are mixed with the Armenians, and it is only in the wooded mountains north of Palu, which attain a great height and are almost inaccessible, that they possess an exclusive domain into which neither the Turkish army nor the inquisitive traveller has ever penetrated. The subjugation of this last refuge of Kurdish independence has been planned by Hafiz Pasha. When the Egyptian war broke out, this district, therefore, remain closed to European exploration, and will likely remain so for a long time to come. Within the limits we have indicated, the Kurds inhabit the zone which extends from the region of the fir tree and the palamut oak, down to that of the olive and pomegranate, from the steep rocks and snow-covered peaks whence the streams gush noisily forth, down to the valleys and rice fields, through which the same streams flow with gentle windings. Agriculture is limited to this zone, for the peaks above are covered with snow and masses of ice, even when the sun has scorched up all the vegetation in the treeless steppes below. The Kurdish villages afford a pleasant prospect. As the traveller approaches them, he beholds, while still far off, groups of walnut trees under whose shade the houses lie hidden. Near the spring or brook, which is never absent, there stands, as a rule, a plantation of poplars, which are indispensable for the building of cottages. As they are well watered, and exposed to the life-giving heat of the sun, these trees reach an extraordinary height in an incredibly short time. They grow as thickly as the blades in a cornfield, and the trunks are slim and straight like reeds. The villages are surrounded by vineyards, olive plantations, gardens or cornfields, according to the altitude, but only a very few of them can boast of a minaret, which the smallest Turkish village possesses. The outer walls of their dwelling houses are built of a kind of air-dried brick, which is made of clay and crushed straw, without any wood. Instead of windows, there are only a few narrow openings, which are placed rather high, and are not closed, as neither glass nor paper is known in these districts. The entrance is guarded by a strong oaken door. The ceiling is made of a layer of poplars, placed at intervals of nine inches. Over these branches are laid, and the whole is covered with clay and gravel, to a thickness of about one or one and a half feet. This platform is used by the family as a sleeping place during the summer, and is often surrounded by a parapet, about four feet high. The houses of the wealthier people have two stories, and are sometimes built of stone. They are generally provided on one side with a square tower. Everything is arranged with a view to defence in their intestine feuds. Besides the small apartments, where the women are kept in strictest seclusion, there is, in the interior, a larger room, which is the same as the Selamik of the Turks. At the upper end is a fireplace or hearth, on a level with the floor. On both sides is a low divan with cushions and the wealthier people have a carpet on the floor. This is all the furniture that the room contains. The paths which connect the different villages are most precipitous, and cannot be passed even on mules without risk. To the unaccustomed rider, the effect is appalling. Each community keeps to itself, and neither needs nor desires intercourse with the others. The principal occupation of the women is weaving the cotton and mixed silks, the red and black striped materials for the wide trousers, the black mantles of goat hair, which, together with sandals and white felt caps, compose the dress of the men. With the aid of a few sticks set upright in the ground, they weave the beautiful and durable carpets, which are the chief luxury of their homes. The men till the fields, tend the flocks, and smoke, or go out to fight. It would be very difficult to give even an approximate idea of the number of the Kurds. In any case, it exceeds half a million. The greater number are Muslims, on the Persian frontier there are Christian Kurds, and on the Sinshar and southern boundaries live the Yazids, whom the Turks believe to be devil worshippers, and who are, therefore, allowed to be sold as slaves. The Armenians who live amongst them in considerable numbers are all Christians of the Greek church. All Kurds have a certain national likeness. Their skin is not any darker than that of their neighbours, the Turkomans and Armenians. They are generally tall and stalwart, their noses are aquiline, but their eyes are set very close together, which sometimes gives them the appearance of squinting. They show great dexterity and practical knowledge in the works they construct for the purposes of irrigation. Without the use of any levelling instruments, they conduct water from the springs and streams for leagues along the mountainsides, to the point where they are in need of the element which is here indispensable for all vegetation. The mountain slopes are often cut into terraces up to an astonishing height, just as in our best cultivated vine districts, in order to gain a few feet of productive soil. 
plantations, fields and aqueducts are the principal features of Kurdish agriculture. Such is the home and the climate to which this race is so deeply attached. When, in the year 1838, Hafiz Pasha had driven the inhabitants of Kasandakh with fire and the sword into their highest and most inaccessible hiding places, and when, now that they were surrounded on all sides, food began to be scarce, a deputation of their elders appeared before the tent of the conqueror to implore his pity. The Pasha knew of no better means of transforming these people into faithful subjects of the port than that of transplanting them from their inaccessible mountains into the plain. There, he promised them ten times the property they possessed at their homes. On such occasions, his generosity knew no bounds. Freedom from all taxes and military service for three years, and pointed out to them in bright colours the riches they would be able to gain by the cultivation of the silkworm and by horse breeding instead of mulberry picking and sheep rearing. But one might as well offer to build a nest for a fish. Mournfully, the old men looked up to heaven, promising everything they were asked. Then they returned to their families loaded with presents, and reported how they had been received. Thereupon the women and children took up arms, the skirmishes were renewed, and did not end till the insurgents were entirely defeated. But the project of a colonisation in the plain had to be abandoned. Kurdistan is an aggregate of single communities without any bond of union. Sometimes, but very rarely, an old castle may be seen, perched on a lofty and inaccessible mountain top or hedged in between perpendicular walls of rock. These castles are used by some of the bays, not as residences, but as places of refuge in times of danger. None of these small princes exercise permanent authority over any great part of the country, and it is only in times of danger and distress that men like Ravandus Bay, Vedahan Bay, and Sayed Bay have been able to gather any considerable body of their countrymen round their standards. But even then, these armies melted away in a very short time, and each soldier refused to defend more than his own hearth. This is where the weakness of the people lies. They would be unconquerable if they were united, but none of them have ever attempted to lend a helping hand to their neighbours, and while Reshid and Hafiz Pasha were invading one district, the others rejoiced in their temporary safety, till it was their turn. From the Arabs, who present a complete contrast to this people, the Kurds have been protected by a natural frontier since their last settlements in the plain were destroyed by troops of horsemen from the desert. The Arabian lion cannot harm the Kurdish falcon in these mountain clefts, and on the other hand, the latter is powerless against the former, so long as he remains in his own element. Persia would be the most dangerous enemy of the Kurds, on account of her nearness, if she had not sunk into total impotence. They did succumb to the pashas of Baghdad and Diyarbakir, but principally because at that time, a large army of 50,000 men could be employed against them, which the Padishah was obliged to maintain in that remote region, for quite a different purpose, that is, to keep a watch on Ibrahim. The port herself knows best what sacrifices of men, money and material are required in order to occupy Kurdistan for the space of a few years. She was, however, compelled to make these sacrifices, as without the help of Kurdistan, it would have been impossible for her to bear the burden of the status quo for seven years. Her artillery, which was conveyed into these mountain valleys with immense exertion by camels or by human labour, provided her with a weapon far superior to anything which the Kurds could bring against it and yet castles with garrisons from 40 to 80 men resisted all their attempts for 32 days, or even 40 days. Meanwhile, famine and disease made dreadful havoc among the besiegers, and if Hafiz Pasha's last expedition came speedily to an end, it was principally owing to the fact that Kurds were fighting against Kurds. The same men who fought so badly in the plain, under the Turkish flag, were now seen storming entrenched caverns, villages and strongholds, or defending them with the utmost daring. The love of plunder and the love of home were powerful motives on one of these occasions, but on the other they were absent. The nature of the soil seldom permits the Kurds to fight on horseback. Their cavalry, who ride excellent horses, are generally armed with bows and arrows, or with long lances of bamboo, the upper ends of which are ornamented with thick pads of ostrich feathers. For defence they still carry their little round shells of wickerwork covered with skins, but the long gun which the foot soldiers carry with its Persian barrels of damask-keened iron, still often provided with a matchlock, is a terrible weapon in so perilous and difficult a country. All this shows that there is a strong defensive element in the Kurdish nation, and one must not imagine for a moment that the Russians would not meet with an extremely obstinate resistance if they ever attempted the conquest of this country. Here they would find the same fanaticism and the same difficult mountain warfare so uncongenial to the Russian soldier that they have been compelled to face in the Caucasus, where, 
spite of the sea and the nearness of the country to their own, their efforts have hitherto been in vain. But the same considerations show that the Kurds are not much to be feared when they assume the offensive. The large towns outside their territory are perhaps a temptation to them, but though they may plunder them now and then, they do not care to possess them or shut themselves up within those walls which glow with the heat of the sun. In particular, Mosul and Baghdad lie quite out of the sphere of their operations. Nor are we inclined to regard their latest insurrection as a matter vitally affecting the continuance of the Turkish Empire. Kurdistan has never been assimilated into it, but has only been for a time mechanically mixed with other provinces. In its present condition, it is not to be regarded as a corroding cancer, but as a dissevered member of that great political body of which so many limbs have already perished. It is also quite possible that the Turkish army now available for use in Asia may, by once more marching through these lovely valleys, burning the villages and trampling down the crops, force a few Kurdish districts into renewed obedience to the Padishah. But the fact that it would be necessary to repeat the same bloody work again and again, and that every levy of recruits or collection of taxes would demand a similar display of power, suggests serious considerations as to the state of the empire, which Europe is at present so interested in preserving by her fleets and her armies. End of The Country and the People of the Kurds by Helmut von Moltke Luck or cunning as the main means of organic modification, The Excise Mice by Samuel Butler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I have quoted in all 97 passages, as near as I can make them, in which Mr. Darwin claimed the theory of descent, either expressly by speaking of my theory in such connection that the theory of descent ought to be, and as the event has shown, was understood as being intended, or by implication, as in the opening passages of The Origin of Species, in which he tells us how he had thought the matter out without acknowledging obligation of any kind to earlier writers. The original edition of The Origin of Species contained 490 pages, exclusive of index. A claim, therefore, more or less explicit to the theory of descent, was made on the average about once every five pages throughout the book from end to end. The claims were most prominent in the most important parts, that is to say, at the beginning and end of the work, and this made them more effective than they are made even by their frequency. A more ubiquitous claim than this, it would be hard to find in the case of any writer advancing a new theory. It is difficult, therefore, to understand how Mr. Grant Allen could have allowed himself to say that Mr. Darwin laid no sort of claim to originality or proprietorship in the theory of descent with modification. Nevertheless, I have only found one place where Mr. Darwin pinned himself down beyond possibility of retreat, however ignominious, by using the words, my theory of descent with modification. He often, as I have said, speaks of my theory, and then shortly afterwards of descent with modification, under such circumstances that no one who had not been brought up in the school of Mr. Gladstone could doubt that the two expressions referred to the same thing. He seems to have felt that he must be a poor wriggler if he could not wriggle out of this, give him any loophole, however small, and Mr. Darwin could trust himself to get out through it, but he did not like saying what left no loophole at all, and my theory of the sandwich modification closed all the exits so firmly that it is surprising he should ever have allowed himself to use these words. As I have said, Mr. Darwin only used this direct categorical form of claim in one place, and even here, after it had stood through three editions, two of which had been largely altered, he could stand it no longer, and altered the my into the in 1866, with the fourth edition of The Origin of Species. This was the only one of the original 45 mys that was cut out before the appearance of the fifth edition in 1869, and this excision throws curious light upon the working of Mr. Darwin's mind. 
The selection of the most categorical Mai out of the whole 45 shows that Mr. Darwin knew all about his Mai's and, while seeing reason to remove these, held that the others might very well stand. He even left on my view of descent with modification, which, though more capable of explanation than my theory, etc., still runs it close. Nevertheless, the excision of even a single my that had been allowed to stand through such close revision as those to which the origin of species had been subjected betrays an easiness of mind, for it is impossible that even Mr. Darwin should not have known that though the my excised in 1866 was the most technically categorical, the others were in reality just as guilty, though not our oscillum in the shape of excision fell upon them. If, then, Mr. Darwin was so uncomfortable about this one as to catch it out, it is probable he was far from comfortable about the others. This view derives confirmation from the fact that in 1869, with the fifth edition of The Origin of Species, there was a stampede of mice throughout the whole work, no less than 30 out of the original 45 being changed into the, our, this, or some other word, which, though having all the effect of my, still did not say my outright. These mys were, if I may say so, sneaked out. Nothing was said to explain the removal to the reader or call attention to it. Why, it may be asked, having been considered during the revisions of 1861 and 1866, and with only one exception allowed to stand, why should they be smitten with a home in instinct in such large numbers with the fifth edition? It cannot be maintained that Mr. Darwin had had his attention called now for the first time to the fact that he had used my perhaps a little too freely and had better be more sparing of it for the future. The Mai Excise in 1866 shows that Mr. Darwin had already considered this question and saw no reason to remove any but the one that left him no loophole. Why then should that which was considered and approved in 1859, 1861 and 1866, not to mention the second edition of 1859 or 1860, be retreated from with every appearance of panic in 1869? Mr. Darwin could not well have cut out more than he did, not at any rate without saying something about it, and it would not be easy to know exactly what say. Of the fourteen mice that were left in 1869, five more were cut out in 1872, and nine only were allowed eventually to remain. We naturally ask, why leave any if 36 ought to be cut out? Or why cut out 36 if nine ought to be left? Especially when the claim remains practically just the same after the excision as before it. I imagine complaint had early reached Mr. Darwin that the difference between himself and his predecessors was unsubstantial and hard to grasp. Traces of some such feeling appear even in the late Sir Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, in which he writes that he had reprinted his abstract of Lamarck's doctrine word for word, in justice to Lamarck, in order to show how nearly the opinions taught by him at the beginning of this century resembled those now in vogue among a large body of naturalists respecting the infinite variability of species and the progressive development in past time of the organic world. Sir Charles Lyell could not have written thus if he had thought that Mr. Darwin had already done justice to Lamarck, nor is it likely that he stood alone in thinking as he did. It is probable that more reached Mr. Darwin than reached the public, and that the historical sketch prefixed to all editions after the first 6,000 copies had been sold, meager and slovenly as it is, was due to earlier manifestation on the part of some of Mr. Darwin's friends of the feeling that was afterwards expressed by Sir Charles Lyell in the passage quoted above. I suppose the removal of the mine that was cut out in 1866 to be due partly to the Glastonian tendencies of Mr. Darwin's mind, which would naturally make that particular mine at all times more or less offensive to him, and partly to the increase of objection to it that must have ensued on the addition of the brief but imperfect historical sketch in 1861. 
It is doubtless only by an oversight that this particular mic was not cut out in 1861. The stampede of 1869 was probably occasioned by the appearance in Germany of Professor Haeckel's History of Creation. This was published in 1868, and Mr. Darwin no doubt foresaw that it would be translated into English, as indeed it subsequently was. In this book, some account is given, very badly but still much more fully than Mr. Darwin, of Lamarck's work. And even Erasmus Darwin is mentioned, inaccurately, but still he is mentioned. Professor Haeckel says, Although the theory of development had been already maintained at the beginning of this century by several great naturalists, especially by Lamarck and Goethe, it only received complete demonstration and causal foundation nine years ago through Darwin's work, and it is on this account that it is now generally, though not altogether rightly, regarded as exclusively Mr. Darwin's theory. Later on, after giving nearly a hundred pages to the works of the early evolutionists, pages that would certainly disquiet the sensitive writer who had cut out the Mai which disappeared in 1866, he continued, We must distinguish clearly, though this is not usually done, between, firstly, the theory of descent as advanced by Lamarck, which deals only with the fact of all animals and plants being descended from a common source, and secondly, Darwin's theory of natural selection, which shows us why this progressive modification of organic forms took place. This passage is as inaccurate as most of those by Professor Haeckel that I have had occasion to examine have proved to be. Letting alone that Buffon, not Lamarck, is the foremost name in connection with the scent, I have already shown in Evolution Old and New, that Lamarck goes exhaustively into the how and why of modification. He alleges the conservation or preservation in the ordinary course of nature of the most favorable among variations that have been induced mainly by function. This, I have sufficiently explained, is natural selection, though the words natural selection are not employed. But it is the true natural selection which, if so metaphorical an expression is allowed to pass, actually does take place with the results ascribed to it by Lamarck, and not the false Charles Darwinian natural selection that does not correspond with facts and cannot result in specific differences such as we now observe. But waving this, the mice within which a little rift had begun to show itself in 1866, might well become as mute in 1869 as they could become without attracting attention when Mr. Darwin saw the passages just quoted and the hundred pages or so that lie between them. I suppose Mr. Darwin cut out the five more mice that had disappeared in 1872 because he had not yet fully recovered from his care and allowed nine to remain in order to cover his retreat and tacitly say that he had not done anything and knew nothing whatever about it. Practically, indeed, he had not retreated, and must have been well aware that he was only retreating technically, for he must have known that the absence of acknowledgement to any earlier writers in the body of his work, and the presence of the many passages in which every word conveyed the impression that the writer claimed descent with modification, amounted to a claim as much when the actual word my had been taken out as while it was allowed to stand. We took Mr. Darwin at his own estimate, because we could not for a moment suppose that a man of means, position and education, one moreover who was nothing if he was not unself-seeking, could play such a trick upon us while pretending to take us into his confidence. Hence the almost universal belief on the part of the public, of which Professors Haeckel and Ray Lancaster and Mr. Grant Allen alike complain, namely that Mr. Darwin is the originator of the theory of descent and that his variations are mainly functional. Men of science must not be surprised if the readiness with which we responded to Mr. Darwin's appeal to our confidence is succeeded by a proportionate resentment when the peculiar shabbiness of his action becomes more generally understood. For myself, I know not which most to wonder at, the meanness of the writer himself, or the greatness of the service that, in spite of that meanness, he unquestionably rendered. 
If Mr. Darwin had been dealing fairly by us when he saw that we had failed to catch the difference between the Erasmus Darwinian theory of descent through natural selection from among variations that are mainly functional, and his own alternative theory of descent through natural selection from among variations that are mainly accidental, and above all, when he saw we were crediting him with other men's work, he would have hastened to set us right. It is with great regret, he might have written, and with no small surprise that I find how generally I have been misunderstood as claiming to be the originator of the theory of descent with modification. Nothing can be further from my intention. The theory of descent has been familiar to all biologists from the year 1749, when Buffon advanced it in its most comprehensive form, to the present day. If Mr. Darwin had said something to the above effect, no one would have questioned his good faith, but it is hardly necessary to say that nothing of the kind is to be found in any one of Mr. Darwin's many books or many editions, nor is the reason why the requisite correction was never made far to seek. For if Mr. Darwin had said as much as I have put into his mouth above, he should have said more, and would ere long have been compelled to have explained to us wherein the difference between himself and his predecessors precisely lay, and this would not have been easy. Indeed, if Mr. Darwin had been quite open with us, he would have had to say much as follows. I should point out that, according to the evolutionists of the last century, improvement in the eye, as in any other organ, is mainly due to persistent rational employment of the organ in question, in such slightly modified manner as experience and changed surroundings may suggest. You will have observed that, according to my system, this goes for very little, and that the accumulation of fortunate accidents, irrespectively of the use that may be made of them, is by far the most important means of modification. Put more briefly still, the distinction between me and my predecessors lies in this, my predecessors thought they knew the main normal cause or principle that underlies variation, whereas I think that there is no general principle underlying it at all, or that even if there is, we know hardly anything about it. This is my distinctive feature. There is no deception. I shall not consider the arguments of my predecessors, nor show in what respect they are insufficient. In fact, I shall say nothing whatever about them. Please to understand that I alone am in possession of the master key that can unlock the bars of the future progress of evolutionary science. So great an improvement, in fact, is my discovery, that it justifies me in claiming the theory of descent generally, and I accordingly claim it. If you ask me in what my discovery consists, I reply in this, that the variations which we are all agreed accumulate are caused by variation. I admit that this is not telling you much about them, but it is as much as I think proper to say at present. Above all things, let me caution you against thinking that there is any principle of general application underlying variation. This would have been right. This is what Mr. Darwin would have had to have said if he had been frank with us. It is not surprising, therefore, that he should have been less frank than might have been wished. I have no doubt that many a time between 1859 and 1882, the year of his death, Mr. Darwin bitterly regretted his initial error, and would have been only too thankful to repair it, but he could only put the difference between himself and the early evolutionists clearly before his readers, at the cost of seeing his own system come tumbling down like a pack of cards. This was more than he could stand, so he buried his face ostrich-like in the sand. I know no more pitiable figure in either literature or science. As I write these lines, July 1886, I see a paragraph in Nature, which I take it is intended to convey the impression that Mr. Francis Darwin's life and letters of his father will appear shortly. I can form no idea whether Mr. F. Darwin's forthcoming work is likely to appear before this present volume, Still less can I conjecture what it may or may not contain. But I can give the reader a criterion by which to test the good faith with which it is written. 
If Mr. F. Darwin puts the distinctive feature that differentiates Mr. C. Darwin from his predecessors clearly before his readers, enabling them to seize and carry it away with them once for all, if he shows no desire to shirk this question, but on the contrary, faces it and throws light upon it, then we shall know that his work is sincere, whatever its shortcomings may be in other respects, and when people are doing their best to help us and make us understand all that they understand themselves, a great deal may be forgiven them. If, on the other hand, we find much talk about the wonderful light which Mr. Charles Darwin threw on evolution by his theory of natural selection, without any adequate attempt to make us understand the difference between the natural selection, say, of Mr. Patrick Matthew and that of his more famous successor, then we may know that we are being trifled with, and that an attempt is being again made to throw dust in our eyes. And the flock or cunning as the main means of organic modification, the excised lies by Samuel Butler, read by Claudia Caldi. The Exiled Lottery, an excerpt from Chapter Two of Richard Harding Davis's Three Gringos in Venezuela. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A few months ago, I was dining alone in Delmonico's when the same young man passed out through the room and stopped on his way beside my table. Do you remember me? He said. I met you once in a smoking car in Texas. Well, I've got a story now that's better than any you'll find lying around here in New York. You want to go to a little bay called Puerto Cortez on the eastern coast of Honduras in Central America and look over the exiled Louisiana State Lottery there. It used to be the biggest gambling concern in the world, but now it's been banished to a single house on a mud bank covered with palm trees, and from there it reaches out all over the United States and sucks in thousands and thousands of victims like a great octopus. You want to go there and write a story about it. Good night, he added. Then he nodded again with a smile and walked across the room and disappeared into Broadway. When a man that you have met once in a smoking car interrupts you between courses to suggest that you are wasting your time in New York and that you ought to go to a coral reef in Central America and write a story of an outlawed lottery, it naturally interests you, even if it does not spoil your dinner. It interested me, at least, so much that I went back to my rooms at once and tried to find Puerto Cortez on the map. And later, when the cold weather set in and the grass plots in Madison Square turned into piled-up islands of snow, surrounded by seas of slippery asphalt, I remembered the palm trees and went south to investigate the exiled lottery. This is how this chapter and this book came to be written. Everyone who goes to any theater in the United States may have to read among the advertisements on the program an oddly worded one which begins, Conrad, 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 and which goes on to say that, quote, in accepting the presidency of the Honduras National Lottery Company, parentheses, Louisiana State Lottery Company, end parentheses, I shall not surrender the presidency of the Gulf Coast Ice and Manufacturing Company of Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Therefore, address all proposals for supplies, machinery, etc., as well as all business communications to Paul Conrad, Puerto Cortez, Honduras, CARE, Central America Express, Fort Tampa City, Florida, USA. End quote. You have probably read this advertisement often and enjoyed the naive manner in which Mr. Conrad asks for correspondence on different subjects, especially on that relating to all business communications, and how at the same time he has so described his whereabouts that no letters so addressed would ever reach his faraway home of Puerto Cortez, but would be promptly stopped at Tampa, as he means that they should. 
after my anonymous friend had told me of puerto cortez i read of it on the program with a keener interest and puerto cortez became to me a harbor of much mysterious moment of a certain dark significance and of possible adventure I remembered all that the lottery had been before the days of its banishment, and all that it had dared to be when, as a corporation legally chartered by the state of Louisiana, it had put its chain and collar upon legislatures and senators, judges and editors, when it had silenced the voice of the church and the pulpit by great gifts of money to charities and hospitals, so giving out a lump sum with one hand what it had taken from the people in dollars and half dollars five hundred and six hundred fold with the other i remembered when its trademark in open face type l a s l was as familiar in every newspaper in the united states as were the names of the papers themselves when it had not been excommunicated by the postmaster-general and it had not to hide its real purpose under a carefully worded paragraph in theatrical programs or on dodgers or handbills that had an existence of a moment before they were swept out into the street and which as they were not sent through mails were not worthy the notice of the federal government it was not so very long that it requires any effort to remember it it is only a few years since the lottery held its drawings freely and with much pomp and circumstance in the charles theatre and generals beauregard and early presided at these ceremonies selling the names they had made glorious in a lost cause to help a cause which was for the lottery people at least distinctly a winning one for in those days the state lottery cleared above all expenses seven million dollars a year and generals beauregard and early drew incomes from it much larger than the government paid to the judges of the supreme court and the members of the cabinet who finally declared against the company and drove it into exile there had been many efforts made to kill it in the past and the state lottery was called the national disgrace and the modern slavery and louisiana was spoken of as a blot on the map of our country as was utah when polygamy flourished within her boundaries and defied the laws of the federal government the final rally against the lottery occurred in eighteen ninety when the lease of the company expired and the directors applied to the legislature for a renewal at that time it was paying out but very little and taking in fabulous sums how much it really made will probably never be told but its gains were probably no more exaggerated by its enemies than was the amount of its expenses by the company itself its outlay for advertising for instance which must have been one of its chief expenses was only forty thousand dollars a year which is a little more than a firm of soap manufacturers pays for their advertising for the same length of time and it is rather discouraging to remember that for a share of this bribe every newspaper in the city of new orleans and in the state of louisiana with a few notable exceptions became an organ of the lottery and said nothing concerning it but what was was good to this sum may be added the salaries of its officers the money paid out in prizes the cost of printing and mailing the tickets and the sum of forty thousand dollars paid annually to the state of louisiana this tribute was considered as quite sufficient when the lottery was first started and while it struggled for ten years to make a living but in 1890, when its continued existence was threatened, the company found that it could very well afford to offer the state not 40000 but a million dollars a year, which gives a faint idea of what its net earnings must have been. As a matter of fact, in those palmy times when there were daily drawings, the lottery received on some days as many as eighteen to 20,000 letters with orders for tickets enclosed, which averaged five dollars a letter. It was Postmaster General Wanamaker who put a stop to all this by refusing to allow any printed matter concerning the lottery to pass outside of the state of Louisiana, which decision, when it came, proved to be the order of exile to the greatest gambling concern of modern times. 
the lottery of course fought this decision in the courts and the case was appealed to the supreme court of the united states and was upheld and from that time no letter addressed to the lottery in this country are known to contain matter referring to the lottery and no newspaper advertising it can pass through the mails this ruling was known before the vote on the renewal of the lease came up in the legislature of louisiana and the lottery people say that knowing that they could not under the new restrictions afford to pay the sum of a million dollars a year they ceased their efforts to pass the bill granting a renewal of their lease and let it go without a fight this may or may not be true but in any event the bill did not pass and the greatest lottery of all times was without a place in which to spin its wheel without a charter or a home and was cut off from the most obvious means of communication with its hundreds of thousands of supporters but though it was excommunicated outlawed and exiled it was not beaten it still retained agents all over the country and it still held its customers who were only waiting to throw their money into its lap and still hoping that the next drawing would bring the grand prize for some long time the lottery was driven about from pillar to post and knocked eagerly here and there for admittance seeking a home and resting place it was not at first successful the first rebuff came from mexico where it had proposed to move its plant but the mexican government was greedy and wanted too large a sum for itself or what is more likely did not want so well organized a rival to threaten the earnings of her own national lottery then the republics of colombia and nicaragua were each tempted with the honor of giving a name to the new company but each declined that distinction and so it finally came begging to honduras the least advanced of all the central american republics and the most heavily burdened with debt honduras agreed to receive the exile and to give it her name and protection for the sum of twenty thousand dollars a year and twenty per cent of its gross earnings it would seem that this to a country that has not paid the interest on her national debt for twelve years was a very advantageous bargain but as four presidents and as many revolutions and governments have appeared and disappeared in the two years in which the lottery people had received their charter in honduras the benefit of the arrangement to them has not been an obvious one and it was not until two years ago that the first drawing of the lottery was held at puerto cortez the company celebrated this occasion with a pitiful imitation of its former pomp and ceremony and there was much feasting and speech-making and a special train was run from the interior to bring important natives to the ceremonies but the train fell off the track four times and was just a day late in consequence the young man who had charge of the train told me this and he also added that he did not believe in lotteries during these two years when representatives of the company were taking rides of nine days each to the capital to overcome the objections of the new presidents who had sprung into office while these same representatives had been making their return trip to the coast others were seeking a foothold for the company in the united states the need of this was obvious and imperative the necessity which had been forced upon them of holding the drawings out of this country and of giving up the old name and trademark was serious enough though it had been partially overcome it did not matter where they spun their wheel but if the company expected to live there must be some place where it could receive its mail and distribute its tickets other than the hot little honduran port locked against all comers by quarantine for six months of the year and only to be reached during the other six by a mail that arrives once every eight days the lottery could not entirely overcome this difficulty of course but through the aid of the express companies of this country it was able to effect a substitute and through this cumbersome and expensive method of transportation its managers endeavored to carry on the business which in the days when the post office helped them had brought them in twenty thousand letters in twenty-four hours 
they selected for their base of operations in the united states the port of tampa in the state of florida that refuge of prize fighters and home of unhappy englishmen who had invested in the swamp lands there under the delusion that they were buying town sites and orange plantations and which masquerades as a winter resort with a thermometer that not infrequently falls below freezing so tampa became their home and though the legislature of that state proved incorruptible so the lottery people themselves tell me there was at least an understanding between them and those in authority that the express company was not to be disturbed and that no other lottery was to have a footing in florida for many years to come if Puerto Cortez proved interesting when it was only a name on a theater program, you may understand to what importance it grew when it could not be found on the map of any steamship company in New York, and when no paper of that city advertised dates of sailing to the port. For the first time, Lowe's Exchange failed me and asked for time, and the ubiquitous Cook and Sons threw up their hands and offered in desperation and as a substitute a comfortable trip to Upper Burma or to Mozambique, protesting that Central America was beyond even their finding out. Even the Maritime Exchange confessed to a much more intimate knowledge of the west coast of China than of that little group of republics which lies only a three or four days journey from the city of new orleans so i was forced to haunt the shipping offices of bowling green for days together and convinced myself while so engaged that that is the only way properly to pursue the study of geography and i advise every one to try it and submit the idea respectfully to instructors of youth for you will find that by the time you have interviewed fifty shipping clerks and learned from them where they can set you down and pick you up and exchange you to a fruit vessel or coasting steamer, you will have obtained an idea of foreign ports and distances which can never be gathered from flat maps or little revolving globes. I finally discovered that there was a line running from New York and another from New Orleans, the fastest steamer of which latter line, as I learned afterwards, was subsidized by the lottery people. They use it every month to take their representatives and clerks to Puerto Cortez, when, after they have held the monthly drawing, they steam back again to New Orleans or Tampa, carrying with them the list of winning numbers and prizes. It was in the boat of this latter line that we finally awoke one morning to find her anchored in the harbor of Puerto Cortez. The harbor is a very large one and a very safe one. It is encircled by mountains on the seaside and by almost impenetrable swamps and jungles on the other. Close around the waters of the bay are bunches and rows of the coconut palm and a village of mud huts covered with thatch. There is also a tin custom house, which includes the railroad office and the commandantia, and this and the jail are barracks of rotting whitewashed boards and the half-dozen houses of one story belonging to consuls and shipping agents are the only other frame buildings in the place, save one. That is a large mansion with broad verandas, painted in colors, and set in a carefully designed garden of rare plants and manaka palms. Two poles are planted in the garden, one flying a blue and white flag of Honduras, the other with the stripes and stars of the United States. This is the home of the exiled lottery. It is the most pretentious building and the cleanest in the whole Republic of Honduras, from the Caribbean Sea to the Pacific Slope. I confess that I was foolish enough to regard this house of magnificent exterior, as I viewed it from the wharf, as seriously as a general observes the ramparts and defenses of the enemy before making his advance. I had taken a nine days' journey with the single purpose of seeing and getting at the truth concerning this particular building, and whether I was now to be viewed with suspicion and treated as an intruder, whether my object would be guessed at once and I should be forced to wait on the beach for the next steamer, or whether I would be received with kindness, which came from ignorance of my intentions, I could not tell. And while I considered, a black Jamaican negro decided my movements for me. 
There was a hotel, he answered, doubtfully, but he thought it would be better, if Mr. Barros would let me in, to try for a room in the lottery building. Mr. Barrows sometimes takes boarders, he said, and the lottery building is a fine house, sir, finest house this side of Mexico City. He added, encouragingly, that he spoke English very good, and that he had been in London. Sitting on the wide porch of the lottery building was a dark-faced, distinguished-looking little man, a creole, apparently, with white hair and a white goatee. He rose and bowed as I came up through the garden, and inquired of him if he was the manager of the lottery, Mr. Barrows, and if he could give me food and shelter. The gentleman answered that he was Mr. Barrows, and that he could and would do as I asked, and appealed with hospitable warmth to a tall, handsome woman with beautiful white hair to support him in his invitation. Mrs. Barrows assented kindly, and directed her servants to place a rocking chair in the shade, and requested me to be seated in it. Luncheon, she assured me, would be ready in a half hour, and she hoped that the voyage south had been a pleasant one. And so, within five minutes after arriving in the mysterious harbor of Puerto Cortez, I found myself at home under the roof of the outlawed lottery, and being particularly well treated by its representative, and feeling particularly uncomfortable in consequence. I was heartily sorry that I had not gone to the hotel, and so, after I had been in my room, I took pains to ascertain exactly what my position in the house might be, and whether or not, apart from the courtesy of Mr. Barrows and his wife, for which no one could make return, I was on the same free footing that I would have been in a hotel. I was assured that I was regarded as a transient boarder, and that I was a patron rather than a guest, but as I did not yet feel at ease, I took courage and explained to Mr. Barrows that I was not a coffee planter or a capitalist, looking for a concession from the government, but that I was in Honduras to write of what I found there. Mr. Barrows answered that he knew already why I was there, from the New Orleans papers, which had arrived in a boat with me, and seemed rather pleased than otherwise to have me about the house. This set my mind at rest, and though it may not possibly be of the least interest to the reader, it is of great importance to me that the same reader should understand that all which I write here of the lottery was told to me by the lottery people themselves, with the full knowledge that I was going to publish it. And later, when I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Duprez, the late editor of the States in New Orleans, and then in Tegucigalpa as representative of the lottery, I warned him in the presence of several of our friends to be careful, as I would probably make use of all he told me, to which he agreed and continued answering questions for the rest of the evening. I may also add that I have taken care to verify the figures used here, for the reason that the lottery people are at such an obvious disadvantage in not being allowed by law to reply to what is said of them, nor to correct any mistake in any statements that may be made to their disadvantage. I had never visited a hotel or a country house as curious as the one presided over by Mr. Barrows. It was entirely original in its decoration, unique in its sources of entertainment, and its business office, unlike most business offices, possessed a peculiar fascination. The stationery for the use of the patrons, and on which I wrote to innocent friends in the north, bore the letterhead of the Honduras Lottery Company. The pictures on the walls were framed groups of lottery tickets, purchased in the past by Mr. Barrows, which had not drawn prizes, and the safe in which the guest might place his valuables contained a large canvas bag sealed with red wax and holding in prizes for the next drawing $75,000. Wherever you turned were evidences of the peculiar business that was being carried on under the roof that sheltered you, and outside in the garden stood another building containing the printing presses on which the lists of winning numbers were struck off before they were distributed broadcast about the world. 
but of more interest than all else was the long sunshiny empty room running the full length of the house in which on a platform at one end were two immense wheels one of glass and brass and as transparent as a bowl of goldfish and the other closely draped in a heavy canvas hood laced and strapped around it and holding sealed and locked within its great bowels one hundred thousand paper tickets in one hundred thousand rubber tubes in this atmosphere and with these surroundings my host and hostess lived their life of quiet conventional comfort a life full of the lesser interests of every day and lighted for others by their most gracious and kindly courtesy and hospitable good will when i sat at their table i was always conscious of the great wheels showing through the open door from the room beyond like skeletons in a closet but it was not so with my host whose chief concern might be that our glasses should be filled nor with my hostess who presided at the head of the table which means more than sitting there with that dignity and charm which is peculiar to a southern woman and which make dining with her an affair of state and not one of appetite i had come to see the working of a great gambling scheme and i had anticipated that there might be some difficulty put in the way of my doing so but if the lottery plant had been a cider press in an orchard i could not have been more welcome to examine and to study it and to take it to pieces it was not so much that they had nothing to conceal or that now while they are fighting for existence they would rather risk being abused than not mentioned at all for they can fight abuse they have had to do that for a long time it is silence and oblivion that they fear now the silence that means they are forgotten and their arrogant glory has departed that they are only a memory they can fight those who fight them but they cannot fight with people who if they think of them at all think of them as already dead and buried it was neither of these reasons that gave me free admittance to the workings of the lottery it was simply that to mr and mrs barris the lottery was a religion it was the greatest charitable organization of the age and the purest philanthropist of modern times could not have more thoroughly believed in his good works than did mrs barrows believe that noble and generous benefits were being bestowed on mankind at every turn of the great wheel in her back parlor this showed itself in the admiration which she shares with her husband for the gentlemen of the company and their coming once a month is an event of great moment to mrs barrows who must find it dull sometimes in spite of the great cool house with its many rooms and broad porches and gorgeous silk hangings over the beds and the clean linen and airy sunlit dining-room she is much more interested in telling the news that the gentlemen brought down with them when they last came than in the result of the drawing and she recalls the compliments they paid her garden but she cannot remember the number that drew the capital prize it was interesting to find this big gambling scheme in the hands of two such simple kindly people and to see how commonplace it was to them how much a matter of routine and of habit they sang its praises if you wished to talk of it but they were more deeply interested in the lesser affairs of their own household and at one time we ceased discussing it to help try on the baby's new boots that had just arrived on the steamer and patted them on the place where the heels should have been to drive them on the extremities of two waving fat legs we all admired the tassels which hung from them and which the baby tried to pull off and put in his mouth they were bronze boots with black buttons and the first the baby had ever worn and the event filled the home of the exiled lottery with intense excitement in the cool of the afternoon mr barrows sat on the broad porch rocking himself in a big bentwood chair and talked of the civil war in which he had taken an active part with the enthusiasm and detail with which only a southern speaks of it not knowing that to this generation in the north it is history and something of which one reads in books and is not a topic of conversation of as fresh interest as the fall of tammany or the venezuela boundary dispute and as we listened we watched mrs barrows moving about among her flowers with a sunshade above her white hair and holding her train in her hand stopping to cut away a dead branch or to pluck a rose or to turn a bud away from the leaves so that it might feel the sun 
and inside young barros was going over the letters which had arrived with the morning steamer emptying out the money that came with them on the table filing them away and noting them as carefully and as methodically as a bank clerk and sealing up in return the little green and yellow tickets that were to go out all over the world and which had been paid for by clerks on small salaries laboring men of large families idle good-for-nothings visionaries born gamblers and ne'er-do-wells and that multitude of others of this world who want something for nothing and who trust that a turn of luck will accomplish for them what they are too listless and faint-hearted and lazy ever to accomplish for themselves it would be an excellent thing for each of these gamblers if he would look in at the great wheel at puerto cortez and see just what one hundred thousand tickets look like and what chance his one atom of a ticket has of forcing its way to the top of that great mass at the exact moment that the capital prize rises to the surface in the other wheel he could have seen it in the old days at the charles theatre and he is as free as is any one to see it to-day at puerto cortez but i should think it would be unfortunate for the lottery if any of its customers became too thorough a student of the doctrine of chances the room in which the drawings are held is about forty feet long well lighted by many long wide windows and with the stage upon which the wheels stand blocking one end it is unfurnished except for the chairs and benches upon which the natives or any chance or intentional visitors are welcome to sit and to watch the drawing the larger wheel which holds when all the tickets are sold the hopes of one hundred thousand people is about six feet in diameter with sides of heavy glass bound together by a wooden tire two feet wide this tire or rim is made of staves formed like those of a hogshead and in it is a door a foot square after the tickets have been placed in their little rubber jackets and shoveled into the wheel this door is locked with a padlock and strips of paper are pasted across it and sealed at each end and so it remains until the next drawing one hundred thousand tickets in rubber tubes an inch long and a quarter of an inch wide take up a great deal of space and make such an appreciable difference in the weight of the wheel that it requires the efforts of two men pulling on the handles at either side to even budge it another man and myself were quite satisfied when we had put our shoulders to it and had succeeded in turning it a foot or two but it was interesting to watch the little black tubes with even that slow start go slipping and sliding down over the others leaving the greater mass undisturbed and packed together at the bottom as a wave sweeps back the upper layer of pebbles on a beach this wheel was manufactured by jackson and sharp of wilmington delaware the other wheel is much smaller and holds the prizes it was made by john robinson of baltimore whenever there is a drawing general w l cabell of texas and colonel c j villery of louisiana who have taken the places of the late general beauregard and of the late general early take their stand at different wheels general cabell at the large and colonel villery at the one holding the prizes they opened the doors which they had sealed up a month previous and into each wheel a little indian girl puts her hand and draws out a tube the tube holding the ticket is handed to general cabell and the one holding the prize one is given to colonel villery and they read the numbers aloud and the amount won six times three times in spanish and three times in english on the principle probably of the man in the play who had only one line and who spoke that twice so that the audience will know i am saying it the two tickets are then handed to young barrows who fastens them together with a rubber band and throws them in the basket for further reference three clerks with duplicate books keep tally of the numbers and of the prizes won the drawings begin generally at six in the morning and lasts until ten and then everybody having been made rich the philanthropists and generals and colonels and indian girls and let us hope the men who turned the wheel go in to breakfast 
so far as i could see the drawings are conducted with fairness but with only three thousand four hundred and thirty four prizes and one hundred thousand tickets the chances are so infinitesimal and the advantage to the company so enormous that honesty in manipulating the wheel ceases to be a virtue and becomes the lottery's only advertisement but what is most interesting about the lottery at present is not whether it is or is not conducted fairly but that it should exist at all that its promoters should be willing to drag out such an existence at such a price and in so fallen a state this becomes all the more remarkable because the men who control the lottery belong to a class which as a rule cares for the good opinion of its fellows and is willing to sacrifice much to retain it but the lottery people do not seem anxious for the good opinion of any one and they have made such vast sums of money in the past and they have made it so easily that they cannot release their hold on the geese that are laying the golden eggs for them even though they find themselves exiled and excommunicated by their own countrymen if they were thimble riggers or confidence men in need of money their persistence would not appear so remarkable but these gentlemen of the lottery are men of enormous wealth their daughters are in what is called society in new orleans and in new york their sons are at the universities and they themselves belong to those clubs most difficult of access one would think that they had reached the point where they could say we are rich enough now and we can afford to spend the remainder of our lives in making ourselves respectable becky sharp is authority for the fact that it is easy to be respectable on as little as five hundred pounds a year but these gentlemen having many hundreds of thousands of pounds are not even willing to make the effort two years ago when according to their own account they were losing forty thousand dollars a month and which after all is only what they once cleared in a day and when they were being driven out of one country after another like the cholera or any other disease it seems strange that it never occurred to them to stop fighting and to get into a better business while there was yet time even the keeper of a roulette wheel has too much self-respect to continue turning when there is only one man playing against the table and in comparison with him the scramble of the lottery company after the honduran tin dollar and the scant savings of servant girls and of brakemen and negro barbers in the united states is to me the most curious feature of this once great enterprise what a contrast it makes with those other days when the charles theatre was filled from boxes to gallery with the flower of southern chivalry and beauty when the band played and the major generals proclaimed the result of the drawings it is hard to take the lottery seriously for the day when it was worthy of abuse has passed away and indeed there are few men or measures so important as to deserve abuse while there is no measure if it be for good so insignificant that it is not deserving the exertion of a good word or a line of praise and gratitude and only the emotion one can feel for the lottery now is the pity which you might have experienced for a william m tweed when as a fugitive from justice he sat on the bench at santiago de cuba and watched a naked fisherman catch his breakfast for him beyond the first line of breakers or that you might feel for monte carlo were it to be exiled to a fever-stricken island off the swampy coast of west africa or to pay the lottery a very high compliment indeed that which you give to that noble adventurer exiled to the isle of elba there was something almost pathetic to me in the sight of this great arrogant gambling scheme that had in its day brought the good name of a state into disrepute that had boasted of the prices it paid for the honor of men and that had robbed a whole nation willing to be robbed spinning its wheel in a back room in a hot half barbarous country and to an audience of gaping indians and unwashed honduranian generals sooner than fall as low as that it would seem to be better to fall altogether to own that you are beaten 
that the color has gone against you too often and like the honourable gambler and gentleman mr john oakhurst who struck a streak of bad luck about the middle of february eighteen sixty four to put a pistol to your head and go down as arrogantly and defiantly as you had lived end of the exiled lottery by richard harding davis read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in december two thousand twenty two Hans Josef Land by Encyclopedia Britannica. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Natter. Hans Josef Land, an Arctic archipelago lying east of Spitsbergen and north of Novaya Zemlya, extending northward from about 80 to 82 degrees north and between 42 and 64 degrees east. It is described as a lofty, glacier-covered land, reaching an extreme elevation of about 2,400 feet. The glaciers front, with a perpendicular ice wall, a shore of debris, on which a few low plants are found to grow, poppies, mosses, and the like. The islands are volcanic, the main geological formation being tertiary or Jurassic basalt, which occasionally protrudes through the ice cap in high isolated blocks near the shore. A connecting island chain between Franz Josef Land and Spitsbergen is probable. The bear and fox are the only land mammals. Insects are rare, but the avifauna is of interest, and the Jackson expedition distinguished several new species. August Petermann expressed the opinion that Baffin may have sighted the west of Franz Josef Land in 1614, but the first actual discovery is due to Julius Paya, a lieutenant in the Austrian army, who was associated with Weyprecht in the second polar expedition fitted out by Count Wilczek on the ship Tegethoff in 1872. On the 13th of August, 1873, the Tegethoff being then beset, high land was seen to the northwest. Later in the season, Pyer led expedition to Hochstetter and Wilczek Islands, and after a second winter in the ice-bound ship, a difficult journey was made northward through Austria Sound, which was reported to separate two large masses of land, Wilczek Land on the east, from Zichy Land on the west, to Cape Fligely in 82 degrees, 5 minutes north, where Rawlinson Sound branched away to the northeast. Cape Fligely was the highest latitude attained by Paya, and remained the highest attained in the Old World till 1895. Pyer reported that from Cape Fligely, land, Rudolf Land, stretched northeast to a cape, Cape Sherat Osborne, and mountain ranges were visible to the north, indicating lands beyond the 83rd parallel, to which the names King Oscar Land and Petermann Land were given. In 1879, the Brune sighted high land in the Fritz Josef Land region, but otherwise it remained untouched until Lee Smith in the yacht Era explored the whole southern coast from 42 to 54 degrees east in 1881 and 1882, discovering many islands and sounds, and ascertaining that the coast of Alexandra Land, in the extreme west, trended to northwest and north. After Lee Smith came another pause, and no further mention is made of Franz Josef Land till 1894. In that year, Mr. Alfred Hamsworth, afterwards Lord Northcliffe, fitted out an expedition in the ship Windward, under the leadership of Mr. F. G. Jackson, with the object of establishing a permanent base from which systematic exploration should be carried on for successive years, and, if practicable, a journey should be made to the Pole. Mr. Jackson and his party landed at Elmwood, which was named from Lord Northcliffe's seat in the Isle of Thanet, near Cape Flora, at the western extremity of Northbrook Island, on the 7th of September. Under a preliminary reconnaissance to the north, which afterwards turned out to be vitally important, the summer of 1895 was spent in exploring the coast to the northwest by a boating expedition. This expedition visited many of the points seen by Lee Smith, and discovered land which, it has been suggested, may be the Hillis land, reported by the Dutch Captain Hillis in 1707. In 1896, the jackson harmsworth expedition worked northwards through an archipelago for about 70 miles and reached Cape Richthofen, 
a promontory 700 feet high, whence an expanse of open water was seen to the northward, which received the name of Queen Victoria Sea. To the west, on the opposite side of a wide opening, which was called the British Channel, appeared glacier-covered land, and an island lay to the northward. The island was probably the King Oscar land of Paya. To north and northeast was the land which had been visited in the reconnaissance of the previous year, but beyond it a water sky appeared in the supposed position of Peterman land. Thus Zishi land itself was resolved into a group of islands, and the outlying land sighted by Paya was found to be islands also. Meanwhile Nansen, on his southward journey, had approached Franz Josef land from the northeast, finding only sea at the north end of Vilcek land, and seeing nothing of Pyers Rawlinson Sound or of the north end of Austria Sound. Nansen wintered near Cape Norway, only a few miles from the spot reached by Jackson in 1895. He had finally proved that a deep oceanic basin lies to the north. On the 17th of June, 1896, the dramatic meeting of Jackson and Nansen took place, and in the same year the Windward revisited Elmwood and brought Nansen home, the work of the jackson Hamsworth expedition being continued for another year. As the non-existence of land to the north has been proved, the attempt to penetrate northwards was abandoned, and the last season was devoted to a survey and scientific examination of the archipelago, especially to the west. This was carried out by Messrs. Jackson, Armitage, R. Ketlitz, H. Fisher, and W. S. Bruce. Further light was thrown on the relations of Franz Josef Land and Spitzbergen during 1897 by the discoveries of Captain Robertson of Dundee, and Witches Land was circumnavigated by Mr. Arnold Pike and Sir Saville Crossley. The latter voyage was repeated in the following year by a German expedition under Dr. Theodor Lerner and Captain Rüdiger. In August 1898, an expedition under Mr. Walter Wellman, an American, landed at Cape Tegethoff. Beginning a northward journey with sledges at the end of the winter, Wellman met with an accident which compelled him to return, but not before some exploration had been accomplished, and the eastern extension of the archipelago fairly well defined. In June 1899, His Royal Highness the Duke of Abruzzi started from Christiania in his yacht, the Stella Polare, to make the first attempt to force a ship into the newly discovered ocean north of Franz Josef Land. The Stella Polare succeeded in making her way through the British Channel to Crown Prince Rudolf Land and wintered in Teplitz Bay in 81 degrees 33 minutes northern latitude. The ship was nearly wrecked in the autumn and the party had to spend most of the winter on shore, the Duke of Abruzzi suffering severely from frostbite. In March 1900, a sledge party of 13, under Captain Cani, started northwards. They found no trace of Paterman land, but with great difficulty crossed the ice to 86 degrees 33 minutes north latitude, 20 miles beyond Nansen's farthest, and 240 miles from the pole. The party, with the exception of three, returned to the ship after an absence of 104 days, and the Stella Polare returned to Trumso in September 1900. In 1901-1902, to the baldwin Ziegler expedition also attempted a northward journey from Franz Josef Land. End of Franz Josef Land by Encyclopedia Britannica Helena Modreska by Encyclopedia Britannica This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Nater. Helena Modreska, 1844-1909, to Polish actress, was born at Krakow on the 12th of October, 1844. Her father, Michael Opido, was a musician and her tastes soon declared themselves strongly in favor of a dramatic career, but it was not until after her marriage in 1861 that she first attempted to act, and then it was with a company of strolling players. Her husband, whose name, Modrejewski, she simplified for stage purposes, died in 1865. In 1868 she married Count Bożenta Chłopowski, a Polish politician and critic, and almost immediately afterwards received an invitation to act at Warsaw. There she remained for seven or eight years, 
and won a high position in her art. Her chief tragic roles were Ophelia, Juliet, Desdemona, Queen Anne in Richard III, Louisa Miller, Maria Stuart, Schiller's Princess Eboli, Marion de Lorme, Victor Hugo's Tisbe, and Słowacki's Mazeppa. In comedy, her favorite roles were Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing and Donna Diana in the Polish translation of an old Spanish play of that name. Madame Modjeska was also the Polish interpretess of the most prominent plays of Legour, Dumas, Father and Son, Augier, Alfred de Musset, Octave Fuyer, and Serdou. In 1876, she went with her husband to California, where they settled on a ranch. This new career, however, proved a failure, and Madame Modjeska returned to the stage. She appeared in San Francisco in 1877 in an English version of Adrienne Le Couvert, and in spite of her imperfect command of the language, achieved a remarkable success. She continued to act principally in America, but was also seen from time to time in London and elsewhere in the United Kingdom, her repertory including several Shakespearean roles and a variety of emotional parts in modern drama. She died on the 9th of April, 1909, at her home near Los Angeles, California. End of Helena Modjeska Obi in the Caribbean by Henry S. Whitehead This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker Obi in the Caribbean by Henry S. Whitehead Shortly before the annual Christmas horse races on the American West Indian island of Santa Cruz in 1922, a young colored man named Andus living in Christianstead, was murdered, and the murderer was subsequently convicted in the American District Court. The object of this murder was to procure Andus's heart and liver. An Obi doctor had been engaged to work voodoo on one of the racehorses owned by a black man, and the heart and liver were the necessary materials for the magicking. The horse in question, which had been Obi doctored, happened to win the race. Immediately afterward, one of the gentlemen planters of Santa Cruz went over to Puerto Rico to purchase a first-class racehorse with which to make certain that the Obi horse should be beaten at the Easter races. The new horse won his race against the doctored horse, and what gave promise of a recrudescence of black African magic on this island of Uncle Sam's newest colony, the Virgin Islands, died a natural death. Obi bottles hanging on fruit trees, particularly those which bear the nutritious avocado pear, are common sights in the West Indies. These are ordinary bottles, ornamented weirdly with seeds, bits of string, scraps of red flannel, etc. These Obi bottles are usually effective deterrents against theft of the ripening fruit. They are taboo signs which, if disturbed, will arouse the malicious anger of Jumbi. Of course, only the black people use magic, although belief in it is not wholly confined to the ignorant black population of those jewel-like islands which form the sweeping northern boundary of the Caribbean Sea. There is something weirdly approaching the sacramental about the West Indian magical practices. Here is a perverted application of the principle of the outward and visible being bound up with the inwardness, the spirituality of affairs. The invisible creation of God as the black African West Indian sees the matter, may be either good or evil, like the visible creation, and may be invoked and even compelled. The West Indian hills are full of this magic, Obi, or Obeya. It is part of the very atmosphere breathed by West Indians. The black shadow of Obeya and voodoo, bad magic, i.e. deleterious, lies a great cloud over the minds of the blacks. Once, of course, the slave population of these incredibly fruitful and lovely isles. Take God, drop. A bit of food has fallen from the hand in eating. It means that Jumbi wants that bit of food, is favoring the eater. Therefore, he thanks God for Jumbi's favor, a characteristic anomaly. Cabin doors are carefully closed at nightfall, lest Jumbi plague the sleepers. It is better to swelter through an airless night than to risk Jumbi's pranks or malice. Jumbi, so visitors may be assured, 
was invented by the old planters to keep the blacks indoors after nightfall. Belief in him seems nearly universal through the islands. In the French islands of Guadalupe and Martinique, he is Zombie, a close philological relative. Probably Jumbi originated on the African west coast in the hinterlands, all the way from Dakar to the Congo Basin. He is one of the most important personages in the West Indies. He is a kind of demon, any kind. The term is generic. On Martinique and elsewhere among French-speaking Negroes, one of his varieties is the Zomblesse. A Zomblesse is half man or woman, half demon, a person able, like Stevenson's Thrawn Janet, to shed his skin, hang it on a nail, and go out marauding after nightfall, when the tropic dark ushers in the Myrmidons of Eblis to plague Ham's sons. Finding and salting the skin renders the discoverer immune from any subsequent injury from that particular zomblesse. On the doors of negro cabins in the country, i.e. outside the towns, crosses may be seen much like those the Hebrews made with the blood of the Passover lamb. This is to keep out the wolf. The werewolf, especially inimical to prospective mothers, may also be kept out by placing sand on the cabin roof, since the marauder must, by the nature of his being, pause to count the grains before proceeding to tear up the roof. This is wolf curiosity, and that is almost an epithet. All the usual characteristics of the werewolf are also present in the West Indian variety. There is canacanthropy, as well as lycanthropy, extant. The central figure of this belief takes the form of a little black woman who transforms herself into a little white dog, which bounds up steps. Touching the dog with any part of the body is certain immediate death. A blow from a stick will turn the dog, which increases in size and fierceness with every step upward, and then the little old woman may be heard pattering away, howling with the pain of the blow. Under certain ancient tamarins and up sundry cane-filled ranges lurks the dread sow with seven pigs. It is a dreadful portent if these run across the path of a late returning reveler. Many varieties of West Indian obi cannot be described, and these include not the least interesting from the viewpoint of the ethnologist. In them, definite phobias are invoked, more or less successfully. It is a question of beliefs, les idées fixes. Snake cut, recently described in Harper's Magazine by an ID witness, is still practiced in the Guiana hinterlands, though I think it is unknown in the West India Islands proper. There, back of French, British, and Dutch Guiana, is a little transplanted Africa, and Africa changeth not. In the police court at Frederickstead, Virgin Islands, in October 1925, before the late Justice J. L. Curry, a case of slander was tried. One old woman had entitled another, To me face, your honor, a ruthless old Carthaginian. That means a Carthaginian, i.e. a pirate, a marauder. It was Cato the Elder who enunciated Delinde e Carthago so insistently before his confrere in the Roman Senate in the 2nd century BC. But to this day, black West Indians call each other Carthaginians when they desire denunciatory emphasis. Carthage was an African seaport. Readers of William Palgrave's Ulysses, which is a more profitable book than James Joyce's similarly entitled Obscenities, will note that Queen Victoria's Consul General at St. Thomas during part of Mr. Seitz's dreadful decade has nothing to say about the Danish West Indies, now the Virgin Islands, though he gives very full accounts of his various other appointments in the British Consular Service. The fact is that Palgrave, who had published in the Cornhill magazine certain animadversions on the ways of St. Thomas society, was literally driven out by a song made by the blacks about him during their spring magicking in the hills back of the town. Wheelam Palgrave is a cha-cha balhu. He is a king of a half a half-Jew. Him go back to Trebizond. He did. There had been certainly hypnotism put into that silly little song, which contains delicate ironies quite imperceptible on its surface, which penetrated her Britannic Majesty's consul general's head and literally drove him out, so that St. Thomas' society was rid of its gadfly. Love filters, curative simples, made from common West Indian herbs and charms of every description are in common everyday use among the blacks, as well as the practices deriving from all the usual superstitions. Many authentic cures are recorded, 
for obi means both good and bad magic, obeya being strictly the good or curative variety. Next to interior Africa, Haiti is probably the most magic-infested place in the world. There, even the continental European-educated intellectuals appear to believe in magic, and Haiti has always labored under the dead weight of these beliefs. It is not uncommon for a qualified physician to be called in and requested to demonstrate on a cadaver by means of a bodkin thrust through the heart that the dead person actually is dead. The belief back of this practice is in the magic of being near dead. The state is attributed to some enemy or to the papaloi, witch doctor himself, who will, after the obsequies, dig up the dead person, restore animation, and hold him in slavery for the rest of his life. Slavery is the bugaboo of which all West Indian blacks stand in fear. A tooth from a dead is the equivalent of the American rabbit's foot. Armed with this trophy, a gambler is supposed to be consistently lucky. Having a dead man's hand in the possession renders a thief more bold, or immune to capture, or even invisible. Various other members of the human body are believed to possess magical properties. A piece of string is often tied about a great toe to cause the toe to see, and so prevent stumbling. The psychology here is simple and really practicable. The person who devoutly, unquestionably believes that his toe can be made to see will usually correct automatically a propensity to stumble. Under the mental burden of these characteristic superstitions, the blacks of the West Indies live continuously. It is a part, and a very important part, of their lives. It is only too frequently concealed beneath the honest piety of primitive people, their genuine religious conviction, and the regular practice of their religion. In the minds of these simple people there is being waged always a silent, desperate battle between God and his good angels and the powers of darkness. This is no dry theological belief of the sort ordinarily shelved in the minds of persons preoccupied otherwise by daily affairs, and with scant inclination to consider the matters of the spirit, whether good or evil. It is rather the literal condition under which ordinary life is lived. In the West Indies, God and Satan are fighting out destiny of mankind hand in hand, and the strange echoes of that desperate, incessant conflict resound in the preoccupied minds of the Negroes. In the daytime, under the glorious, reassuring sunlight of the Antilles, God reigns, in the minds of a grave but happy and carefree people. But after night, even under the Caribbean moon, which seems twice as large and twice as near as the American moon, the evil powers come forth from their lurking dens, variously to plague the children of Ham, accursed with a lingering, nameless fear, because their ancestor once dared to be so bold as to break a commandment and laugh at Noah his father. End of Obi in the Caribbean by Henry S. Whitehead On the Isthmus of Panama Chapter 5 from the book Three Gringos in Venezuela by Richard Harding Davis Published in 1896 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If Ulysses, in his wanderings, had attempted to cross the Isthmus of Panama, his account of the adventure would not have been filled with engineering reports or health statistics, nor would he have dwelt with horror on the irregularities of the canal company. He would have treated the isthmus in language full of imagination, and would have delivered his tale in the form of an allegory. He would have told how on such a voyage his ship came upon a strip of land joining two great continents and separating two great oceans, how he had found this isthmus guarded by a wicked dragon that exhaled poison with every breath, and that lay in wait, buried in its swamps and jungles, for sailors and travelers who withered away and died as soon as they put their foot upon the shore. But that he, warned in time by the sight of thousands of men's bones whitening on the beach, hoisted all sail and stood out to sea. It is quite as easy to believe a story like that as to believe the truth, 
that for the last century a narrow strip of swamp land has blocked the progress of the world that it has joined the peoples of two continents without permitting them to use it as a thoroughfare that it has stopped the meeting of two great oceans and the shipping of the world and that it has killed with its fever half of those who came to do battle against it there is something almost uncanny in the manner in which this strip of mud and water has resisted the advance of man as though there really were some evil genius of the place lurking in the morasses and brooding over the waters throwing out its poison like a serpent noiselessly and suddenly meeting the last arrival at the very moment of his setting foot upon the wharf arrogant in health and hope and ambition and leaving him with clenched teeth and raving with madness before the sun sets it is like the old minotaur and his yearly tribute of greek maidens with the difference that now it is the lives of men that are sacrificed and men who are chosen from every nation of the world speaking every language believing in every religion and to-day the end of each is marked by a wooden plank in the catholic cemetery in the hebrew cemetery in the french cemetery in the english cemetery in the american cemetery for there are acres and acres of cemeteries and thousands and thousands of wooden headstones to which the evil spirit of the isthmus points mockingly and says these are your failures the fields of waterloo and gettysburg saw a sacrifice of life but little greater than these fifty miles of swamp land between north and south america have seen and certainly they saw no such inglorious defeats without a banner flying or a comrade cheering or the roar of musketry and cannon to inspire the soldiers who fell in the unequal battle those who died striving to save the holy land from the unspeakable turk were comforted by the promise of a glorious immortality and it must have been gratifying in itself to have been described as a crusader and to have worn the red cross upon one's shoulder and in any event a man who would not fight for his religion or his country without promises or pensions is hardly worthy of consideration but these young soldiers of the transit and sailors of the dredging scow had no promises or sentiment to inspire them they were not fighting for the boundaries of their country but redeeming a bit of no man's land not doing battle for their god but merely digging a canal and it must strike every one that those of them who fell doing their duty in the sickly yellow mist of panama and along the gloomy stretches of the chagres river deserve a better monument to their memories than the wooden slabs in the cemeteries it is strange that not only nature but man also should have selected the same little spot on the earth's surface in which to show to the world exactly how disagreeable and unpleasant they can make themselves when they choose it seems almost as though the isthmus were unholy ground and that there was a curse upon it some one should invent a legend to explain this and tell how one of the priests who came over with columbus put the ban of the church upon the land for some affront by its people to the voyagers and so placed it under a curse for ever for those who the fever did not kill the canal company robbed and the ruin that came to the peasants of france was as irredeemable as the ravages of the fever and the scandal that spattered almost every public man in paris exposed rottenness and corruption as far advanced as that in the green-coated pools along the rio grande ruins are always interesting but the ruins of panama fill one only with melancholy and disgust and the relics of this gigantic swindle can only inspire you with a contempt for yourself and your fellow-men and you blush at the evidences of bare-faced rascality about you and even the honest efforts of those who are now in charge and who are trying to save what remains and once more to build up confidence in the canal reminded me of the town councillors of johnstown who met in a freight depot to decide what was to be done with the town and those of its inhabitants that had not been swept out of existence 
there are forty-eight miles of railroad across the isthmus stretching from the town of panama on the pacific side to that of colon or aspinwall as it was formerly called on the caribbean sea the canal starts a little north of the town of panama in the mouth of the rio grande river and runs along on one side or the other of the railroad to the port of colon the chagres river starts about the middle of the isthmus and follows the route of the canal in an easterly direction until it empties itself into the caribbean sea a little north of colon the town of panama as you approach it from the bay reminds you of an italian seaport owing to the balconies which overhang the water and the colored house fronts and projecting red roofs as seen from the inside the town is like any other spanish-american city of the second class there are fiacres that rattle and roll through the clean but narrow streets behind undersized ponies that always move at a gallop there are cool dark shops open to the streets and hundreds of negroes and chinese coolies and a handsome plaza and some very large municipal buildings of five stories which appeared to us after our experience with the dead level of one-story huts to tower as high as the auditorium panama as a town and considered by itself and not in connection with the canal reminded me of a western county seat after the boom had left it there appeared to be nothing going forward and nothing to do the men sat at the cafes during the day and talked of the past and went to a club at night we saw nothing of the women but they seemed to have a greater degree of freedom than their sisters in other parts of spanish america owing no doubt to the cosmopolitan nature of the inhabitants of panama but the city and the people in it interest you chiefly because of the canal and even the ruins of the spanish occupation and the tales of buccaneers and of bloody battles and varied treasure cannot touch you so nearly as do the great pretentious building of the company and the stories of de Lesseps' visit and the ceremonies and feastings and celebrations which inaugurated the greatest failure of modern times the new director of the canal company put a tug at our disposal and sent us orders that permitted us to see as much of the canal as had been completed from the pacific side but before presenting our orders we drove out from the city one afternoon and began a personally conducted inspection of the machine shops we had read of the pathetic spectacle presented by thousands of dollars worth of locomotive engines and machinery lying rotting and rusting in the swamps and as it had interested us when we had read of it we were naturally even more anxious to see it with our own eyes we however did not see any machinery rusting nor any locomotives lying half buried in the mud all the locomotives that we saw were raised from the ground on ties and protected with a wooden shed and had been painted and oiled and cared for as they would have been in the baldwin locomotive works we found the same state of things in the great machine works and though none of us knew a turning lathe from a sewing machine we could at least understand that certain wheels should make other wheels move if everything was in working order and so we made the wheels go round and punched holes in sheets of iron with steel rods and pierced plates and scraped iron bars and climbed to shelves twenty and thirty feet from the floor only to find that each bit and screw in each numbered pigeonhole was as sharp and covered as thick with oil as though it had been in use that morning this was not as interesting as it would have been had we seen what the other writers who have visited the isthmus saw and it would have given me a better chance for descriptive writing had i found the ruins of gigantic dredging machines buried in the morasses and millions of dollars worth of delicate machinery blistering and rusting under the palm trees but as a rule it is better to describe things just as you saw them and not as it is the fashion to see them even though your way be not so picturesque as a matter of fact the care the company was taking of its machinery and its fleet of dredging scows and locomotives struck me as being much more pathetic than the sight of the same instruments would have been had we found them abandoned to the elements and the mud 
for it was like a general pipe-claying his cross-belt and polishing his buttons after his army had been routed and killed and he had lost everything including honour there was a little village of whitewashed huts on the southern bank of the rio grande where the men lived who take care of the fleet and the machine shop and it was as carefully kept and as clean as a graveyard before the crash came the quarters of the men used to ring with their yells at night and the music of guitars and banjos came from open doors and cafes and drinking booths and a pistol shot meant no more than a momentary punctuation of the night's pleasure those were great days and there were thousands of men where there are now a score and a line of light and devilry ran from the canal's mouth for miles back to the city where it blazed into a great fire of dissolute pleasure and excitement in those days men were making fortunes in a night and by ways as dark as night by furnishing machinery that could not even be put together by supplying blocks of granite that cost more in freight than bars of silver by kidnapping workmen for the swamps and by the simple method of false accounts and credits and while some were growing rich others were living with the fear of sudden death before their eyes and drinking the native rum that they might forget it and throwing their wages away on the roulette tables and eating and drinking and making merry in the fear that they might die on the morrow Mr. Wells, an American engineer, was in charge of the company's flotilla and waited for us at the wharf. "'I saw you investigating our engines,' he said. "'That's all right. Only tell the truth about what you see, and we won't mind.' We stood on the bow of the tug and sped up the length of the canal between great dredging machines that towered as high above us as the bridge of an ocean liner, and that weighed apparently as much as a battleship. The decks of some of them were split with the heat, and there were shutters missing from the cabin windows, but the monster machinery was intact, and the woodwork was freshly painted and scrubbed. They reminded me of a line of old ships of war at rest in some navy yard. They represent, in money value, even as they are today, five million francs. Beyond them, on either side, stretched low green bushes, through which the Rio Grande bent and twisted and beyond the bushes were high hills and the pacific ocean into which the sun set leaving us cold and depressed except for the bubbling of the water under our bow there was not a sound to disturb the silence that hung above the narrow canal and the green bushes that rose from the bed of water I thought of the entrance of the suez canal as i had seen it at port said and at ismailia with great p and o steamers passing down its length and troop ships showing hundreds of white helmets above the sides and tramp steamers and sailing vessels flying every flag and compared it and its scenes of life and movement with this dreary waste before us with the idle dredges rearing their iron girders to the sky the engineers sign posts half smothered in the water and the mud and with the naked fisherman paddling noiselessly down the canal with his eyes fixed on the water his hollowed log canoe the only floating vessel in what should have been the highway of the world there were about eight hundred men in all working along the whole length of the canal while we were there instead of the twelve thousand that once made the place hum with activity but the work the twelve thousand accomplished remains and the stranger is surprised to find that there is so much of it and that it is so well done it looks to his ignorant eyes as though only a little more energy and a greater amount of honesty would be necessary to open the canal to traffic but experts will tell him that one hundred million dollars will have to be expended and seven or eight years of honest work done before that ditch can be dug and france hold a keel celebration of her own but before that happens every citizen of the united states should help to open the nicaragua canal to the world under the protection and the virtual ownership of his own country our stay in panama was shortened somewhat on account of our having taken too great an interest in the freedom of a young lawyer and diplomat who was arrested while we were there charged with being one of the leaders of the revolution 
he was an acquaintance of lord griscom's who took an interest in the young rebel because they had both been in the diplomatic service abroad one afternoon while griscom and the lawyer were sitting together in the office of the latter five soldiers entered the place and ordered the suspected revolutionist to accompany them to the cartel as he happened to know something of the law he protested that they must first show him a warrant and while two of them went out for the warrant and the others kept watch in the outer office griscom mapped out a plan of escape the lawyer's office hung over the bay of panama and griscom's idea was that he should under the protection of the darkness slip down a rope from the window to a small boat below and be rowed out to the barracuta of the pacific mail company's line which was listed to sail the same evening up the coast the friends of the rebel were sent for and with the assistance of griscom made every preparation for the young rebel's escape and then came to the hotel and informed somerset and myself of what he had done and asked us to aid in what was to follow we knew nothing of the rights or the wrongs of the revolutionists but we considered that a man who was going down a rope into a small boat while three soldiers sat waiting for him in an outer room was performing a sporting act that called for our active sympathy so we followed griscom to his friend's office and having passed the soldiers were ushered into his presence and introduced to him and his friends he was a little man but was not at all alarmed nor did he pose or exhibit any braggadocio as a man of weaker caliber might have done under the circumstances when we offered to hold the rope for him or to block up the doors so that the soldiers might not see what was going forward he thanked us with such grateful politeness that he made me feel ashamed of myself for my interest in the matter up to that point had not been a very serious or a high one indeed i did not even know the gentleman's name but as we did not know the names of the government people against whom he was plotting either we felt that we could not be accused of partiality the prisoner did not want his wife to know what had happened and so sent her word that important legal business would detain him at the office and that his dinner was to be brought to him there the rope by which he was to escape was smuggled past the soldiers under the napkin which covered this dinner it was then seven o'clock and nearly dark and as our rebel friend feared our presence might excite suspicion he asked us to go away and requested us to return in half an hour it would then be quite dark and the attempt to escape could be made with greater safety but the alcalde during our absence spoiled what might have been an excellent story by rushing in and carrying the diplomat off to jail when we returned we found the office locked and guarded and as we walked away in doubt as to whether he had escaped or been arrested we found that the soldiers were following us as this continued throughout the evening we went across the isthmus the next morning to cologne the same soldiers accompanying us on our way the ship of war atlanta was at colon and as we had met her officers at puerto cortez in honduras we went on board and asked them to see that we were not shot against church walls or hung they were exceedingly amused and promised us ample protection and though we did not need it on that occasion i was impressed with the comforting sense that comes to a traveller from the states when he knows that one of our white squadron is rolling at anchor in the harbour and later when griscom caught the chagrin's fever we had every reason to be grateful for the presence in the harbor of the atlanta as her officers led by dr bartlett and his assistant surgeon mr moore helped him through his sickness visiting him daily with the greatest kindness and good will cologne did not impress us very favorably it is a large town of wooden houses with a floating population of jamaica negroes and a few chinese the houses built for the engineers of the canal stretch out along a point at either side of the double row of magnificent palms which terminate at the residence intended for de la Seps. it is now falling into decay in front of it facing the sea is a statue of columbus protecting the republic of columbia represented by an indian girl who is crouched under his outstretched arm 
this monument was presented to the united states of colombia by the empress eugenie and the statue is in its fallen state with its pedestal shattered by the many storms in time significant of the fallen fortunes of that lady herself if columbus could have protected columbia from the french as he is in the french statue protecting her from all the world she would now be the richest and most important of central american republics cologne seems to be owned entirely by the panama railroad company a monopoly that conducts its affairs with even more disregard for the public than do other monopolies in better known localities the company makes use of the seaport as a freight yard and its locomotives run the length of the town throughout the entire day blowing continually on their whistles and ringing their bells so that there is little peace for the just or the unjust we were exceedingly relieved when the doctors agreed that griscom was ready to put to sea again and we were able to turn from the scene of the great scandal and its fever fields to the mountains of venezuela and of caracas in particular end of on the isthmus of panama read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in december two thousand twenty two Poland, a study of the land, people, and literature by Georg Brandes, Part 1, Observations and Appreciations, First Impression, 1885. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1. Journey from Vienna to Warsaw, the frontier. Custom House Inspection At eleven o'clock in the forenoon on the 3rd of February, the train left the city of Hans Markart and Johann Strauss, and thoughts and memories of Vienna long continued to revolve in my brain. Cheerful thoughts and bright memories of captivating friendliness, of cordiality, of warmth of feeling, of the ardour of the moment, of the well-turned speeches of journalists and ex-ministers, the improvisations of young poets, the smiles of elegant women, the jokes and laughter of beautiful soubrettes, the importunities of ladies athirst for literature and autographs, of the pompous marble halls of Theophilus Hansen and the slovenly splendor of the Macart exhibition, and the cosy room where the king of the walls gives his recitals of works, which it is true are only very small works of art, but still genuine art, and for a time I still inhaled the atmosphere of peaceful extravagance, of reckless but kindly joy of life, of amiable second-rate happiness, which fills one's lungs in the great witch's cauldron called Vienna. Vienna is a city of freedom from restraint. How bright are words, hues and music there! If the inhabitants of Berlin have appropriated to themselves the dignity of Schiller's and Muthun Würde, Grace has become the inheritance of the Viennese, for this is a city by itself, which everything becomes, for it has some sense enough not to do anything but what is becoming. How rich in recollections and picturesque is it, how rich in strong traditions in comparison with modern regular Berlin, and how beautiful is the vicinity, how full of character is the peasant's costume here in the region which we are going through, the long white cloaks with red borders, and how well they know how to wear their clothes in comparison with the North German peasants in their stiff, ugly costume. Austria is a rich land in a comparatively peaceful state of dissolution, where there are many kinds of men, but no Austrians. It is true we must accept the imperial family and one or two antiquities of the old constitutionalists, Besides these, there are only Germans in Vienna, as outside Vienna there are only Hungarians, Czechs, etc. The train rushes on. A little Polish servant, accompanying a traveller, calls my attention to a young Russian who now and then spoke French to him. He knows very well that I understand Russian, but still he speaks French to me. That is the way with them all. They are at heart ashamed of being Russians. 
an extremely naive but very significant expression of Polish national hatred. To profit by the daylight while it lasts, I read Sienkiewicz's Bartek Venker in the Nouvelle Review. The train stopped at Granice, the frontier station. Passports have to be inspected and baggage examined. A blonde Russian police soldier in his becoming uniform, a long grey coat, a cap without a visor, a sabre at his side, entered, demanded the passports and carried them away. Then we received permission and orders to alight. When a traveller suggested that we could leave our rugs, overcoats and articles of that kind in the carriage, since we were to return to the same train in an hour, the little Pole informed him of his mistake. Everything must be taken out, even an umbrella left behind excites suspicion, and if a coat is left, the lining is examined. The first things found in my travelling bag were the two numbers of the Nouvelle Review, which I had been reading in the carriage. What is this? asked the chief of the uniformed custom house officers in German. What is it? I answered. It is the Nouvelle Review. Yes, but what is that? A French periodical. What does it contain? Do you understand French? I asked. No. Is there anyone here who understands French? No. There are all sorts of things in it. There are two numbers and there are ten articles in each number. It is impossible to tell in a word what they contain. Then we shall take it and send it to the censor in Warsaw. Is this periodical forbidden? Everything is forbidden that I do not know, and I do not know this book. He then began to flutter among the leaves, forwards and backwards, and seemed to look for papers concealed in the sheets that had not been cut. I was reminded of the old lithograph which represents a monkey rifling the handbag of a traveller and fumbling in his books. Have you any more of this sort? Yes, my trunk is half full of books. They were going to open it when I heard from another officer the expression revolver, which I understood as the word is cosmopolitan. They had found a pistol in my handbag. It circulated among them and was examined. Was it loaded? Yes, with six balls. Would I be kind enough to take them out? I declined decidedly to be kind enough. Then we must. They extracted the balls and afterwards found in the bottom of my trunk a little box of balls which was put with a pistol. Then began the examination proper. Every book, every pamphlet was dug out and laid aside. Every newspaper, even the newspapers in which my shoes were wrapped, were taken out, smoothed and laid in a pile. They asked in what language the books were and what was in them. As my explanation was not found fully satisfactory, they took the whole from me, giving me a receipt for fifteen pounds of literature. At the same time, they demanded three rubles for the transportation of the same literature to Warsaw. I should have attempted bribery if Poles had not previously told me that, above all things, bribery must not be tried in the wrong place. I should run the risk of their taking the attempt as a proof of evil intentions. It was in vain that I urged that I needed the books which they took from me for my work in Warsaw. It was in vain that I called their attention to the fact that they might safely leave me the Danish books and newspapers, since no harm could be done with them in Poland, where no one understands Danish. In the censor's office they understand all languages, was the answer. Grant that that is true, although I have my doubts, but the government censor, who is Russian, I cannot corrupt, and the other people do not understand Danish, do they? That is true from your point of view, was the answer, and acting from their point of view, they kept the books. There was a Danish-French dictionary in the heap. I showed them that it was a dictionary, that the words were arranged in columns. They racked their brains over it. At last, after mature reflection, they gave me the first part, A to L, but with very serious looks replaced part M to Z among the literature which the censor was to examine. When and how can I get all this again? So far as the books are concerned, you can ask for them at the censor's office. 
you have a receipt for them, you will get no receipt for the pistol. But you may address a petition on a whole sheet of paper to the Governor General for permission to carry it. Then, if he thinks fit, he can give an order to the Custom House officer in Warsaw to deliver it to you on your application there. During my stay in Warsaw, in spite of my request, he did not give the order. When one of my friends, after my return to Copenhagen, applied on my behalf to the Governor General for the delivery or return of this weapon, which was guiltless of shedding human blood, he received the following answer. He must, one, obtain from me a power of attorney certified by the Russian consul in Copenhagen, two, make application to the Governor General for permission to take the said revolver over the frontier, three, after having received permission, apply to the Custom House at Granice to send the pistol to the headquarters of the Custom House in Warsaw, four, send the same by mail to Copenhagen and give proof to the office of the Governor General that the revolver had actually been sent. Thus, on the very frontier itself, we got the feeling that from this point we were outside the precinct of real European civilization. In such a trifling matter as the Custom House examination, the two distinguishing marks of the bulk of Russian prudential regulations can be traced the oppressive and the inconsequent. If I had known of the prohibition against having a pistol in my travelling bag, all I needed to do was to put it into my pocket, for the pockets are not searched. If I had known that it was forbidden to carry foreign books, I might have sent them from Vienna to a bookseller in Warsaw, and I should have received them without any delay. The government regulations are not strict enough, and yet so strict that for fear of dismissal, the subordinate officials are compelled to carry out their duty brutally as well as injudiciously. The absurdities which met me on the frontier continually meet the foreigner and sometimes the native born. A few years ago, on the Prussia Russian frontier, one of my friends, who had prepared himself for the medical examination in Warsaw at the time when the university was still Polish, but who was compelled to submit to the examination after it had become Russian, had a Russian grammar, written in Russian, taken from him because the custom house official did not know the book. The Russian rule is not like the Prussian, prudent and uniform. It is incoherent, absurd, and often entrusted to clumsy hands. The pressure upon Russian Poland is so great that it could not be borne for a month if many of the regulations were not chaotic and meaningless, others too trivial to be executed, others easily avoided by bribery, others entrusted to instruments of so little keenness that their effect is destroyed, and others again to such intelligent and cultivated men that they are not put into practice. I had accepted an invitation to deliver three lectures in French in the town hall of Warsaw. In regard to these lectures, I had many difficulties beforehand. I was compelled to prepare them in time to send the manuscript to Warsaw a month before my arrival, as they were to be submitted to a double censorship, the usual one and a special one for public lectures. Since it was certain that if they were sent by the ordinary post, they would be detained for an indefinite period at the frontier, it was necessary to find a more convenient means of transit. Ambassadorial courtesy enabled me to send them by a special hand to St. Petersburg. Thus, they reached their destination without any other delay than that caused by the roundabout journey. Two copies were prepared and sent to the different censors, but after they had twice been read through in French, a day or two before my arrival in Warsaw, a new difficulty arose. The well-known curator of the education department, Apuchtin, the same person who had his ears boxed by a student a year ago, which created a commotion and tumult in the whole city, at the last moment required that all three lectures should be sent in again in a Russian translation. This and the further examination naturally took time. Nevertheless, to the astonishment of many, not a line was struck out, although the lectures contained not a little which, as it appeared, excited emotion in the listeners. 
I was told also that the strictness of the censorship was sometimes neutralized by the carelessness or chivalrousness of the examiner. It seems as if the censor stationed in the hall not always knows very exactly if what is said is really identical with what the lecturer has handed in in his manuscript. It appears here, as in innumerable other cases in Russia, that an order or prohibition in order to be absolutely effective requires a whole system of additional regulations. This is especially so when the prohibition against printing anything has a practical object. In January, the celebrated old poet Odinets died in Warsaw. He was the faithful friend and youthful travelling companion of Mickiewicz, politically a neutral, almost a conservative, but as his name was so intimately associated with memories of the revolt of 1830 and of the period of literary splendor, as moreover he had been so close a friend of Mickiewicz, the most celebrated enemy of the Russian authority, they endeavored by means of the censor to prevent demonstrations at his funeral. Consequently, it was forbidden to keep any public notice of the time of his internment, not only in the newspapers, but by the placards which are commonly posted in the streets and before the churches. The prohibition was enforced, but in spite of it, a procession of 50,000 persons followed Odinets to his grave. It is thus that prohibition and censorship only succeed in acquiring a character for ineffectual spite, this is notably the case with the Polish press. It continually happens that an article is forbidden by the censor on a particular day, but a day or two later the author is allowed to make free use of it. The result of this is only that the suspected newspapers are behind their rivals in the discussion of the subjects of the day. It continually happens also that an article is forbidden by the censor in one newspaper and allowed in another. The passport system has the same character of annoyance without profit as this form of censorship. Without the passport, visit by the Russian consul in your place of residence, generally speaking, you cannot cross the frontier into Russia. It is called for, as already stated, in the railway carriage. It is examined in a separate room during the time while the baggage is being searched and they are so concerned to prevent the traveller from handing it over to some offender or the other that he does not get his passport back till after he has taken his seat in the train, immediately before the last ringing of the bell. A police soldier brings the passports in a case prepared for the purpose with alphabetical letterings. You hardly reach your place of destination before the passport is again called for. It is taken to the police office and kept there during the whole stay of the traveller in the city, and the information there given is supplemented by inquiries of the servants in the house where you reside as to the full names of your parents, whether you are married or unmarried, the unmarried are regarded as the more dangerous, as to several matters. And this passport, which is only given back on the day of departure, is examined again for an hour at the station on the frontier through which you pass on your return journey. Nevertheless, this vigilance also has a gap by which its results are almost wholly destroyed. There is hardly any attempt to ascertain whether the person named in the passport is the same who has presented it. They evidently have no means of knowing whether the name is right, but as the passports are examined en bloc in a separate room from that in which the travellers are collected, they do not attempt to find out if the description corresponds with the person. As nothing is easier than to procure a passport in Germany, Austria, England or France, and then remain at home and let a friend travel with it, the result is wholly out of proportion to the trouble and annoyance, to say nothing of the fact that hundreds who have no passports are daily guided over the frontier on foot by men who are pointed out to everyone who needs them. I had abundant opportunity of thinking over this subject, as during the tiresome delay I walked up and down among the tea and grog-drinking idlers in the dirty waiting room at Granice, annoyed by intruders anxious to change my Austrian money into rubles, consoled by others who explained to me that the officials were quite within the rights in their treatment of me, that the fact of my books being in Danish was no security, 
who could vouch for it that they did not contain accounts of the Socialist Congress in Copenhagen. At last, I got back what was left in my trunk for my own disposal, and without anything contraband except what I had in my head, I arrived the next morning in Warsaw. End of Poland, a study of the land, people and literature by Georg Brandes, part 1, 1, read by Claudia Caldi. President Bill Clinton's first inaugural address, Wednesday, January 20th, 1993, from U.S. Presidential Inaugural Addresses, assembled by James Linden. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maurice Donegan, Atlanta, Georgia, February 1st, 2023. My fellow citizens, today we celebrate the mystery of American renewal. This ceremony is held in the depth of winter. But by the words we speak and the faces we show the world, we force the spring. A spring reborn in the world's oldest democracy that brings forth the vision and courage to reinvent America. When our founders boldly declared America's independence to the world, and our purposes to the Almighty, they knew that America, to endure, would have to change. Not change for change's sake, but change to preserve America's ideals. Life. Liberty. The pursuit of happiness. Though we march to the music of our time, our mission is timeless. Each generation of Americans must define what it means to be an American. On behalf of our nation, I salute my predecessor, President Bush, for his half-century of service to America. And I thank the millions of men and women whose steadfastness and sacrifice triumphed over depression, fascism, and communism. Today, a generation raised in the shadows of the Cold War assumes new responsibilities in a world warmed by the sunshine of freedom, but threatened still by ancient hatreds and new plagues. Raised in unrivaled prosperity, we inherit an economy that is still the world's strongest, but is weakened by business failures, stagnant wages, increasing inequality, and deep divisions among our own people. When George Washington first took the oath I have just sworn to uphold, news traveled slowly across the land by horseback and across the ocean by boat. Now the sights and sounds of this ceremony are broadcast instantaneously to billions around the world. Communications in commerce are global. Investment is mobile. Technology is almost magical. And ambition for a better life is now universal. We earn our livelihood in America today in peaceful competition with people all across the earth. Profound and powerful forces are shaking and remaking our world, and the urgent question of our time is whether we can make change our friend and not our enemy. This new world has already enriched the lives of millions of Americans who are able to compete and win in it. But when most people are working harder for less, when others cannot work at all, when the cost of health care devastates families and threatens to bankrupt our enterprises great and small, when the fear of crime robs law-abiding citizens of their freedom, and when millions of poor children cannot even imagine the lives we are calling them to lead, we have not made change our friend. We know we have to face hard truths and take strong steps, but we have not done so. Instead, we have drifted, and that drifting has eroded our resources, fractured our economy, and shaken our confidence. Though our challenges are fearsome, so are our strengths. Americans have ever been a restless, questing, hopeful people, and we must bring to the task today 
the vision and will of those who came before us. From our revolution, to the Civil War, to the Great Depression, to the Civil Rights Movement, our people have always mustered the determination to construct from these crises the pillars of our history. Thomas Jefferson believed that to preserve the very foundation of our nation, we would need dramatic change from time to time. Well, my fellow Americans, this is our time. Let us embrace it. Our democracy must not only be the envy of the world, but the engine of our own renewal. There is nothing wrong with America that cannot be cured by what is right with America. And so today we pledge an end to the era of deadlock and drift, and a new season of American renewal has begun. To renew America, we must be bold. We must do what no generation has had to do before. We must invest more in our people, in their jobs, and in their future, and at the same time cut our massive debt. And we must do so in a world in which we compete for every opportunity. It will not be easy. It will require sacrifice, but it can be done and done fairly. Not choosing sacrifice for its own sake, but for our own sake. We must provide for our nation the way a family provides for its children. Our founders saw themselves in the light of posterity. We can do no less. Anyone who has ever watched a child's eyes wander into sleep knows what posterity is. Posterity is the world to come, the world for whom we hold our ideals, from whom we have borrowed our planet, and to whom we bear sacred responsibilities. We must do what America does best, offer more opportunity to all, and demand more responsibility from all. It is time to break with the bad habit of expecting something for nothing from our government or from each other. Let us all take more responsibility, not only for ourselves and our families, but for our communities and our country. To renew America, we must revitalize our democracy. This beautiful capital, like every capital since the dawn of civilization, is often a place of intrigue and calculation. Powerful people maneuver for position and worry endlessly about who is in and who is out, who is up and who is down, forgetting those people whose toil and sweat sent us here and paves our way. America deserves better, and in this city today there are people who want to do better. And so I say to all of you here, let us resolve to reform our politics so that the power and privilege no longer shouts down the voice of the people. Let us put aside personal advantage so that we can feel the pain and see the promise of America. Let us resolve to make our government a place for what Franklin Roosevelt called bold, persistent experimentation, a government for our tomorrows, not our yesterdays. Let us give this capital back to the people to whom it belongs. To renew America, we must meet challenges abroad as well as at home. There is no longer a clear division between what is foreign and what is domestic. The world economy, the world environment, the world age crisis, the world arms race, they affect us all. Today, as an old order passes, the new world is more free, but less stable. Communism's collapse has called forth old animosities and new dangers. Clearly, America must continue to lead the world we did so much to make. While America rebuilds at home, we will not shrink from the challenges nor fail to seize the opportunities of this new world. Together with our friends and allies, we will work to shape change, lest it engulf us. When our vital interests are challenged, or the will and conscience of the international community is defied, we will act, with peaceful diplomacy whenever possible, with force when necessary. The brave Americans serving our nation today, in the Persian Gulf, in Somalia, and wherever else they stand, 
are testament to our resolve, but our greatest strength is in the power of our ideas, which are still new in many lands. Across the world, we see them embraced, and we rejoice. Our hopes, our hearts, our hands are with those on every continent who are building democracy and freedom. Their cause is America's cause. The American people have summoned the change we celebrate today. You have raised your voices in an unmistakable chorus. You have cast your votes in historic numbers. You have changed the face of Congress, the presidency, and the political process itself. Yes, you, my fellow Americans, have forced the spring. Now we must do the work the season demands. To that work I now turn with all the authority of my office. I ask Congress to join with me, but no president, no Congress, no government can undertake this mission alone. My fellow Americans, you, too, must play your part in our renewal. I challenge a new generation of young Americans to a season of service, to act on your idealism by helping troubled children, keeping company with those in need, reconnecting our torn communities. There is so much to be done. Enough, indeed, for millions of others who are still young in spirit to give of themselves in service too. In serving, we recognize a simple but powerful truth. We need each other, and we must care for one another. Today we do more than celebrate America. We rededicate ourselves to the very idea of America, an idea born in revolution and renewed through two centuries of challenge, an idea tempered by the knowledge that but for fate, we, the fortunate and the unfortunate, might have been each other, an idea ennobled by the faith that our nation can summon from its myriad diversity the deepest measure of unity, an idea infused with the conviction that America's long, heroic journey must go forever upward. And so, my fellow Americans, as we stand on the edge of the 21st century, let us begin anew with energy and hope, with faith and discipline, and let us work until our work is done. The scripture says, And let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. From this joyful mountain top of celebration, we hear a call to service in the valley. We have heard the trumpets, we have changed the guard, and now each in our own way, and with God's help, we must answer the call. Thank you, and God bless you all. End of President Bill Clinton's First Inaugural Address, Wednesday, January 20th, 1993. President Bill Clinton's Second Inaugural Address, January 20th, 1997. From U.S. Presidential Inaugural Addresses, assembled by James Linden. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maurice Donegan, Atlanta, Georgia, February 7th, 2023. My fellow citizens, at this last presidential inauguration of the 20th century, let us lift our eyes towards the challenges that await us in the next century. It is our great good fortune that time and chance have put us not only at the edge of a new century in a new millennium, but on the edge of a bright new prospect in human affairs, a moment that will define our course and our character for decades to come. We must keep our old democracy forever young. Guided by the ancient vision of a promised land, let us set our sights upon a land of new promise. The promise of America was born in the 18th century out of the bold conviction that we are all created equal. It was extended and preserved in the 19th century when our nation spread across the continent, save the Union, 
and abolished the awful scourge of slavery. Then, in turmoil and triumph, that promise exploded onto the world stage to make this the American century. And what a century it has been. America became the world's mightiest industrial power, saved the world from tyranny in two world wars and a long Cold War, and time and again reached out across the globe to millions who, like us, longed for the blessings of liberty. Along the way, Americans produced a great middle class and security in old age, built unrivaled centers of learning and opened public schools to all, split the atom and explored the heavens, invented the computer and the microchip, and deepened the wellspring of justice by making a revolution in civil rights for African Americans and all minorities, and extending the circle of citizenship, opportunity, and dignity to women. Now, for the third time, a new century is upon us, and another time to choose. We began the 19th century with a choice to spread our nation from coast to coast. We began the 20th century with a choice to harness the Industrial Revolution to our values of free enterprise, conservation, and human decency. Those choices have made all the difference. At the dawn of the 21st century, a free people must now choose to shape the forces of the information age and the global society to unleash the limitless potential of all our people, and yes, to form a more perfect union. When last we gathered, our march to this new future seemed less certain than it does today. We vowed then to set a clear course to renew our nation. In these four years, we have been touched by tragedy, exhilarated by challenge, strengthened by achievement. America stands alone as the world's indispensable nation. Once again, our economy is the strongest on earth. Once again, we are building stronger families, thriving communities, better educational opportunities, a cleaner environment. Problems that once seemed destined to deepen now bend to our efforts. Our streets are safer, and record numbers of our fellow citizens have moved from welfare to work. And once again, we have resolved for our time a great debate over the role of government. Today, we can declare government is not the problem, and government is not the solution. We, the American people, we are the solution. Our founders understood that well and gave us a democracy, strong enough to endure for centuries, flexible enough to face our common challenges and advance our common dreams in each new day. As times change, so government must change. We need a new government for a new century, humble enough not to try to solve all of our problems for us, but strong enough to give us the tools to solve our problems for ourselves. A government that is smaller, lives within its means, and does more with less. Yet where it can stand up for our values and interests around the world, and where it can give Americans the power to make real differences in their everyday lives, Government should do more, not less. The preeminent mission of our new government is to give all Americans an opportunity, not a guarantee, but a real opportunity to build better lives. Beyond that, my fellow citizens, the future is up to us. Our founders taught us that the preservation of our liberty and our union depends upon responsible citizenship. And we need a new sense of responsibility for a new century. There is work to do, work that government alone cannot do. Teaching children to read, hiring people off welfare rolls, coming out from behind locked doors and shuttered windows to help reclaim our streets from drugs and gangs and crime, taking time out of our own lives to serve others. Each and every one of us in our own way, must assume personal responsibility 
not only for ourselves and our families, but for our neighbors and our nation. Our greatest responsibility is to embrace a new spirit of community for a new century. For any one of us to succeed, we must succeed as one America. The challenge of our past remains the challenge of our future. Will we be one nation, one people, with one common destiny, or not? Will we come together or come apart? The divide of race has been America's constant curse, and each new wave of immigrants gives us new targets to old prejudices. Prejudice and contempt cloaked in the pretense of religious or political convictions are no different. These forces have nearly destroyed our nation in the past. They plague us still. They fuel the fanaticism of terror. And they torment the lives of millions in fractured nations all around the world. These obsessions cripple both those who hate and, of course, those who are hated, robbing both of what they might become. We cannot, we will not, succumb to the dark impulses that lurk in the far regions of the soul everywhere. We shall overcome them. And we shall replace them with the generous spirit of a people who feel at home with one another. Our rich texture of racial, religious, and political diversity will be a godsend in the 21st century. Great rewards will come to those who can live together, learn together, work together, forge new ties that bind together. And as this new era approaches, we can already see its broad outlines. Ten years ago, the Internet was the mystical province of physicists. Today, it is a commonplace encyclopedia for millions of schoolchildren. Scientists are now decoding the blueprint of human life. Cures for our most fear illnesses seem close at hand. The world is no longer divided into two hostile camps. Instead, now we are building bonds with nations that were once our adversaries. Growing connections of commerce and culture give us a chance to lift the fortunes and spirits of people the world over. And for the very first time in all of history, more people on this planet live under democracy than dictatorship. My fellow Americans, as we look back on this remarkable century, we may ask, can we hope not just to follow, but even to surpass the achievements of the 20th century in America, and to avoid the awful bloodshed that stained its legacy? To that question, every American here, and every American in our land today must answer a resounding yes. This is the heart of our task. With a new vision of government, a new sense of responsibility, a new spirit of community, we will sustain America's journey. The promise we sought in a new land, we will find again in a land of new promise. In this new land, education will be every citizen's most prized possession. Our schools will have the highest standards in the world, igniting the spark of possibility in the eyes of every girl and every boy. And the doors of higher education will be open to all. The knowledge and power of the information age will be within the reach of not just the few, but of every classroom, every library, every child. Parents and children will have time not only to work, but to read and play together. And the plans they make at the kitchen table will be those of a better home, a better job, the certain chance to go to college. Our streets will echo again with the laughter of our children, because no one will try to shoot them or sell them drugs anymore. Everyone who can work will work with today's permanent underclass a part of tomorrow's growing middle class. New miracles of medicine, at last, will reach not only those who can claim care now, but the children and the hard-working families too long denied. We will stand mighty for peace and freedom, and maintaining a strong defense against terror and destruction. Our children will sleep free from the threat of nuclear, chemical, 
or biological weapons. Ports and airports, farms and factories will thrive with trade in innovation and ideas. And the world's greatest democracy will lead a whole world of democracies. Our land of new promise will be a nation that meets its obligations, a nation that balances its budget but never loses the balance of its values. A nation where our grandparents have a secure retirement and health care, and their grandchildren know we have made the reforms necessary to sustain those benefits for their time. A nation that fortifies the world's most productive economy, even as it protects the great natural bounty of our water, air, and majestic land. And in this land of new promise, we will have reformed our politics so that the voice of the people will always speak louder than the din of narrow interest, regaining the participation and deserving the trust of all Americans. Fellow citizens, let us build that America, a nation ever moving forward towards realizing the full potential of all of its citizens. Prosperity and power, yes, they are important, and we must maintain them. But let us never forget the greatest progress we have made, and the greatest progress we have yet to make, is in the human heart. In the end, all of the world's wealth and a thousand armies are no match for the strength and decency of the human spirit. Thirty-four years ago, the man whose life we celebrate today spoke to us down there at the other end of this mall, in words that moved the conscience of a nation. Like a prophet of old, he told of his dream that one day America would rise up and treat all of its citizens as equals before the law and in the heart. Martin Luther King's dream was the American dream. His quest is our quest the ceaseless striving to live out our true creed. Our history has been built on such dreams and labors, and by our dreams and labors, we will redeem the promise of America in the 21st century. To that effort, I pledge all of my strength and every power of my office. I ask the members of Congress here to join in that pledge. The American people return to office a president of one party and a Congress of another. Surely they did not do that to advance the politics of petty bickering and extreme partisanship they plainly deplore. No, they call on us instead to be the repairers of the breach and to move on with America's mission. America demands and deserves big things from us, and nothing big ever came from being small. Let us remember the timeless wisdom of Cardinal Bernadine when facing the end of his own life. He said, It is wrong to waste the precious gift of time on acrimony and division. Fellow citizens, we must not waste the precious gift of this time, for all of us are on that same journey of our lives, and our journey, too, will come to an end. But the journey of our America must come go on. And so, my fellow Americans, we must be strong, for there is much to dare. The demands of our time are great, and they are different. Let us meet them with faith and courage, with patience and a grateful and happy heart. Let us shape the hope of this day into the noblest chapter in our history. Yes, let's build our bridge a bridge wide enough and strong enough for every American to cross over to a blessed land of new promise. May those generations whose face we cannot yet see, whose names we may never know, say of us here that we led our beloved land into a new century with the American dream alive for all of her children, with the American promise of a more perfect union, a reality, for all of her people, with America's bright flame of freedom spreading throughout all of the world. From the height of this place and the summit of this century, 
let us go forth. May God strengthen our hands for the good work ahead, and always, always bless our America. End of President Clinton's Second Inaugural Address, January 20th, 1997. An excerpt from the introduction to the Thesaurus of English Words and Phrases, classified and arranged so as to facilitate the expression of ideas and assist in literary composition, by Peter Mark Roger, 1853. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The present work is intended to supply, with respect to the English language, a desideratum hitherto unsupplied in any language, namely a collection of the words it contains and of the idiomatic combinations peculiar to it, arranged not in alphabetical order as they are in a dictionary, but according to the ideas which they express. The purpose of an ordinary dictionary is simply to explain the meaning of words, and the problem of which it professes to furnish the solution may be stated thus, the word being given to find its signification or the idea it is intended to convey. The object aimed at in the present undertaking is exactly the converse of this, namely, the idea being given to find the word or words by which that idea may be most fitly and aptly expressed. For this purpose, the words and phrases of the language are here classed not according to their sound or their orthography, but strictly according to their signification. The communication of our thoughts by means of language, whether spoken or written, like every other object of mental exertion, constitutes a peculiar art which, like other arts, cannot be acquired in any perfection but by long and continued practice. Some, indeed, there are more highly gifted than others with a facility of expression and naturally endowed with the power of eloquence, but to none is it at all times an easy process to embody in exact and appropriate language the various trains of ideas that are passing through the mind or to depict in their true colors and proportions the diversified and nicer shades of feeling which accompany them to those who are unpractised in the art of composition or unused to exemplar speaking these difficulties present themselves in their most formidable aspect However distinct may be our views, however vivid our conceptions, or however fervent our emotions, we cannot but be often conscious that the phraseology we have at our command is inadequate to do them justice. We seek in vain the words we need, and strive ineffectually to devise forms of expression which shall faithfully portray our thoughts and sentiments. The appropriate terms, notwithstanding our utmost efforts, cannot be conjured up at will. Like spirits from the vasty deep, they come not when we call, and we are driven to the employment of a set of words and phrases, either too general or too limited, too strong or too feeble, which suit not the occasion, which hit not the mark we aim at, and the result of our prolonged exertion is a style at once labored and obscure, vapid and redundant, or vitiated by the still graver faults of affectation or ambiguity. It is to those who are thus painfully groping their way and struggling with the difficulties of composition that this work professes to hold out a helping hand. The assistance it gives is that of furnishing on every topic a copious store of words and phrases adapted to express all the recognizable shades and modifications of the general idea under which those words 
and phrases are arranged the inquirer can readily select out of the ample collection spread out before his eyes in the following pages those expressions which are best suited to his purpose and which might not have occurred to him without such assistance in order to make this selection he scarcely ever need engage in any critical or elaborate study of the subtle distinctions existing between synonymous terms for if the materials set before him be sufficiently abundant an instinctive tact will rarely fail to lead him to the proper choice even while glancing over the columns of this work his eye may chance to light upon a particular term which may save the cost of a clumsy paraphrase or spare the labor of a tortuous circumlocution some felicitous turn of expression thus introduced will frequently open to the mind of the reader a whole vista of collateral ideas which could not without an extended and obtrusive episode have been unfolded to his view and often will the judicious insertion of a happy epithet like a beam of sunshine in a landscape illumine and adorn the subject which it touches imparting new grace and giving life and spirit to the picture every workman in the exercise of his art should be provided with proper implements for the fabrication of complicated and curious pieces of mechanism the artisan requires a corresponding assortment of various tools and instruments for giving proper effect to the fictions of the drama the actor should have at his disposal a well-furnished wardrobe supplying the costumes best suited to the personages he is to represent for the perfect delineation of the beauties of nature the painter should have within reach of his pencil every variety and combination of hues and tints now the writer as well as the orator employs for the accomplishment of his purposes the instrumentality of words it is in words that he clothes his thoughts it is by means of words that he depicts his feelings it is therefore essential to his success that he be provided with a copious vocabulary and that he possess an entire command of all the resources and appliances of his language to the acquisition of this power no procedure appears more directly conducive than the study of a methodized system such as that now offered to his use the utility of the present work will be appreciated more especially by those who are engaged in the arduous process of translating into english a work written in another language simple as the operation may appear on a superficial view of rendering into english each of its sentences the task of transfusing with perfect exactness the sense of the original preserving at the same time the style and character of its composition and reflecting with fidelity the mind and the spirit of the author is a task of extreme difficulty the cultivation of this useful department of literature was in ancient times strongly recommended both by cicero and by quintilian as essential to the formation of a good writer and accomplished orator regarded simply as a mental exercise the practice of translation is the best training for the attainment of that mastery of language and felicity of diction which are the sources of the highest oratory and are requisite for the possession of a graceful and persuasive eloquence by rendering ourselves the faithful interpreters of the thoughts and feelings of others we are rewarded with the acquisition of greater readiness and facility in correctly expressing our own as he who has best learned to execute the orders of a commander becomes himself best qualified to command in the earliest periods of civilization translators have been the agents for propagating knowledge from nation to nation and the value of their labors has been inestimable but in the present age when so many different languages have become the depositories of the vast treasures of literature 
and of science which have been accumulating for centuries the utility of accurate translations has greatly increased and it has become a more important object to attain perfection in the art the use of language is not confined to its being the medium through which we communicate our ideas to one another it fulfills a no less important function as an instrument of thought not being merely its vehicle but giving it wings for flight metaphysicians are agreed that scarcely any of our intellectual operations could be carried on to any considerable extent without the agency of words none but those who are conversant with the philosophy of mental phenomena can be aware of the immense influence that is exercised by language in promoting the development of our ideas in fixing them in the mind and detaining them for steady contemplation in every process of reasoning language enters as an essential element words are the instruments by which we form all our abstractions by which we fashion and embody our ideas and by which we are enabled to glide along a series of premises and conclusions with a rapidity so great as to leave in the memory no trace of the successive steps of the process and we remain unconscious how much we owe to this potent auxiliary of the reasoning faculty it is on this ground also that the present work founds a claim to utility the review of a catalogue of words of analogous signification will often suggest by association other trains of thought which presenting the subject under new and varied aspects will vastly expand the sphere of our mental vision amidst the many objects thus brought within the range of our contemplation some striking similitude or appropriate image some excursive flight or brilliant conception may flash on the mind giving point and force to our arguments awakening a responsive chord in the imagination or sensibility of the reader and procuring for our reasonings a more ready access both to his understanding and to his heart it is of the utmost consequence that strict accuracy should regulate our use of language and that everyone should acquire the power and the habit of expressing his thoughts with perspicuity and correctness few indeed can appreciate the real extent and importance of that influence which language has always exercised on human affairs or can be aware how often these are determined by causes much slighter than are apparent to a superficial observer false logic disguised under specious phraseology too often gains the assent of the unthinking multitude disseminating far and wide the seeds of prejudice and error truisms pass current and wear the semblance of profound wisdom when dressed up in the tinsel garb of antithetical phrases or set off by an imposing pomp of paradox by a confused jargon of involved and mystical sentences the imagination is easily inveigled into a transcendental region of clouds and the understanding beguiled into the belief that it is acquiring knowledge and approaching truth a misapplied or misapprehended term is sufficient to give rise to fierce and interminable disputes a misnomer has turned the tide of popular opinion a verbal sophism has decided a party question an artful watchword thrown among combustible materials has kindled the flames of deadly warfare and changed the destiny of an empire in constructing the following system of classification of the ideas which are expressible by language my chief aim has been to obtain the greatest amount of practical utility i have accordingly adopted such principles of arrangement as appeared to me to be the simplest and most natural and which would not require either for their comprehension or application any disciplined acumen 
or depth of metaphysical or antiquarian lore eschewing all needless refinements and subtleties i have taken as my guide the more obvious characters of the ideas for which expressions were to be tabulated arranging them under such classes and categories as reflection and experience had taught me would conduct the inquirer most readily and quickly to the object of his search commencing with the ideas expressing mere abstract relations i proceed to those which relate to the phenomena of the material world and lastly to those in which the mind is concerned and which comprehend intellect volition and feeling thus establishing six primary classes of categories the first of these classes comprehends ideas derived from the more general and abstract relations among things such as existence resemblance quantity order number time power the second class refers to space and its various relations including motion or change of place the third class includes all ideas that relate to the material world namely the properties of matter such as solidity fluidity heat sound light and the phenomena they present as well as simple perceptions to which they give rise the fourth class embraces all ideas of phenomena relating to the intellect and its operations comprising the acquisition the retention and the communication of ideas the fifth class includes the ideas derived from the exercise of volition embracing the phenomena and results of our voluntary and active powers such as choice intention utility action antagonism authority compact property etc the sixth and last class comprehends all ideas derived from the operation of our sentient and moral powers including our feelings emotions passions and moral and religious sentiments a work constructed on the plan of classification i have proposed might if ably executed be of great value in tending to limit the fluctuations to which language has always been subject by establishing an authoritative standard for its regulation future historians philologists and lexicographers when investigating the period when new words were introduced or discussing the import given at the present time to the old might find their labors lightened by being enabled to appeal to such a standard instead of having to search for data among the scattered writings of the age nor would its utility be confined to a single language for the principles of its construction are universally applicable to all languages whether living or dead on the same plan of classification there might be formed a french a german a latin or a greek thesaurus possessing in their respective spheres the same advantages as those of the english model still more useful would be a conjunction of these methodized compilations in two languages the french and the english for instance the columns of each being placed in parallel juxtaposition no means yet devised would so greatly facilitate the acquisition of the one language by those who are acquainted with the other none would afford such ample assistance to the translator in either language and none would supply such ready and effectual means of instituting an accurate comparison between them and of fairly appreciating their respective merits and defects in a still higher degree would all those advantages be combined and multiplied in a polygot lexicon constructed on this system metaphysicians engaged in the more profound investigation of the philosophy of language will be materially assisted by having the ground thus prepared for them 
in a previous analysis and classification of our ideas for such classification of ideas is the true basis on which words which are their symbols should be classified it is by such analysis alone that we can arrive at a clear perception of the relation which these symbols bear to their corresponding ideas or can obtain a correct knowledge of the elements which enter into the formation of compound ideas and of the exclusions by which we arrive at the abstractions so perpetually resorted to in the process of reasoning and in the communication of our thoughts lastly such analyses alone can determine the principles on which a strictly philosophical language might be constructed the probable result of the construction of such a language would be its eventual adoption by every civilized nation thus realizing that splendid aspiration of philanthropists the establishment of a universal language however utopian such a project may appear to the present generation and how abortive may have been the former endeavors of bishop wilkins and others to realize it its accomplishment is surely not beset with greater difficulties than have impeded the progress to many other beneficial objects which in former times appeared to be no less visionary and which yet were successfully achieved in later ages by the continued and persevering exertions of the human intellect is there at the present day then any ground for despair that at some future stage of that higher civilization to which we trust the world is gradually tending some new and bolder effort of genius towards the solution of this great problem may be crowned with success and compass an object of such vast and paramount utility nothing indeed would conduce more directly to bring about a golden age of union and harmony among the several nations and races of mankind than the removal of that barrier to the interchange of thought and mutual good understanding between man and man which is now interposed by the diversity of their respective languages end of an excerpt from the introduction to the thesaurus of english words and phrases by peter mark roger 1853 read for librivox by sue anderson the sherman antitrust act fifty first congress of the united states of america at the first session this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by dale grothman the sherman antitrust act an act to protect trade and commerce against unlawful restraints and monopolies be it enacted by the senate and house of representatives of the united states of america in congress assembled section one every contract combination in the form of trust or otherwise or conspiracy in restraint of trade or commerce among the several states or with foreign nations is hereby declared to be illegal every person who shall make such a contract or engage in any such combination or conspiracy shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor and on conviction thereof shall be punished by fine not exceeding five thousand dollars or by imprisonment not exceeding one year or by both said punishments at the discretion of the court section two every person who shall monopolize or attempt to monopolize or combine or conspire with any other person or persons to monopolize any part of the trade or commerce among the several states or with foreign nations shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor and on conviction thereof shall be punished 
by fine not exceeding five thousand dollars or by imprisonment not exceeding one year or by both said punishments in the discretion of the court section three every contract combination in form of trust or otherwise or conspiracy in restraint of trade or commerce in any territory of the united states or of the district of columbia or in restraint of trade or commerce between any such territory and another or between any such territory or territories and any state or states or the district of columbia or with foreign nations or between the district of columbia and any state or states or foreign nations is hereby declared illegal every person who shall make such a contract or engage in any such combination or conspiracy shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor and on conviction thereof shall be punished by fine not exceeding five thousand dollars or by imprisonment not exceeding one year or both said punishments in the discretion of the court section four the several circuit courts of the united states are hereby invested with jurisdiction to prevent and restrain violations of this act and it shall be the duty of the several district attorneys of the united states in their respective districts under the direction of the attorney general to institute proceedings in equity to prevent and restrain such violations such procedures may be in way of petition setting forth the case and praying that such violations shall be enjoined or otherwise prohibited when the parties complained of shall have been duly notified of such petition the court shall proceed as soon as may be to the hearing and determination of the case and pending such petition and before final decree the court may at any time make such temporary restraining order or prohibition as shall be deemed just in the premises section five whenever it shall appear to the court before which any proceeding under section four of this act may be pending that the ends of justice require that other parties should be brought before the court the court may cause them to be summoned whether they reside in the district in which the court is held or not and subpoenas to that end may be served in any district by the marshal thereof section six any property owned under any contract or by any combination or pursuant to any conspiracy and being the subject thereof mentioned in section one of this act and being in the course of transportation from one state to another or to a foreign country shall be forfeited to the united states and may be seized and condemned by like proceedings as those provided by law for the forfeiture seizure and condemnation of property imported into the united states contrary to the law section seven any person who shall be injured in his business or property by any other person or corporation by reason of anything forbidden or declared to be unlawful by this act may sue therefore in any circuit court of the united states in the district in which the defendant resides or is found without respect to the amount in controversy and shall recover threefold the damages by him sustained and the costs of the suit including any reasonable attorney's fees section eight that the word person or persons whenever used in this act shall be deemed to include corporations and associations existing under or authorized by the laws of either the united states the laws of any of the territories the laws of any state or the laws of any foreign country approved july second eighteen ninety end of the sherman antitrust act fifty first congress of the united states of america at the first session
The South Country by Edward Thomas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sussex, read by Jonathan Jones. A few miles south of that great presiding Pollard Beach is the boundary line between Surrey and Kent on the north and Sussex on the south. A few miles over the line, the moorland organ roll of heather and birch and pine succeeds the grassy undulations and the well-grown beech and oak. The yellow roving lines of the paths cut through the heather into the sand add to the wildness of the waste by their suggestion of mountain torrents and of channels worn in the soft rock or clay by the sea. The same likeness in little, is often to be seen upon a high-pitched roof of thatch, when the straw is earth-coloured and tunnelled by birds and seamed by rain. Here the houses are of stone, unadorned, heather-thatched. The maker of birch heath brooms plies his trade. There are stacks of heath and gorse in the yard. All the more fair are the grooves in the moorland, below the region of pines, where the tiled, white-bordied mill stands by the sheen of a ford, and the gorse is bright, and white clothes are blowing over neat gardens and the first rose. On a day of rain and gloom, the answer of the gorse to sudden lights and heats is delicious. All those dull, grey, and glaucous, and brown, dry spines bursting into cool and fragrant fire is as great a miracle as the turning of flames to roses round the martyr's feet. It is only too easy for the pheasant lords to plant large in parallelograms to escape from them it is necessary to go in amongst them. Yet there are parts of the forest large and dark and primeval in look with a few poor isolated houses and a thin file of telegraph posts crossing it among the high gloomy pines and down to the marshy hollows to the strewn gold of dwarf willows and up again to the deserted wooden windmill and the empty bodied cottage the heather that sheds at the southern edge of the moor looking at this tract of wild land the mine seems to shed many centuries of civilization and to taste something of early man's alarm in the presence of the uncultured hills. An alarm which is in us tempered so as to aid an impression of the sublime. Its influence lingers in the small strips of roadside gorse beyond its proper boundary. Then, southward, there are softly dipping meadows, fields of young corn and oaks thrown among the cowslips. The small farmhouses are neat and good. One has a long stone wall in front, and over the road tall Scotch firs above a green pond, dappled by the water crowsfoot's white blossoms and bordered by sallow and rush. Narrow copses of oak or wide hedges of hazel and sallow line the road. And they are making cask coops under lodges of boughs at the woodsides. Bluebells and primroses and cuckoo flowers are not to be counted under the trees. The long, moist meadows flow among the woods up and down from farm to farm and spire to tower. Each farmhouse group is new. This one is roofed and walled with tiles and opposite is a tangle of grass and gorse, with fowls and hencoops amongst it, a sallowy pond, a pile of faggots, some crooked knees of oak, some fresh-peeled timber. Old grey hop-poles lean in a sheath all round a great oak. The gates are of good unpainted oak, and some few are of a kind not often seen elsewhere, lower than a hurdle and composed of two stout parallel bars, united by twenty uprights, and by two pieces meeting to form a V across these. 
The gates deserve and would fill a book by themselves. Green Lucian canopies of flags shadow one another in the little wayside pools, white railed, for this is the weald, the land of small clay ponds. The hazels are the nightingales. In many of the oak woods, the timber carriages have carved a way through primroses and bluebells deep into the brown clay. The larger views are of cloudy oak woods, ridge behind ridge, and green corn or grass and grey ploughland between, and the sun pouring a molten cataract out of dark, macho collated clouds onto one green field that glows a moment and is insignificant again. The lesser are of little brambly precipitous sandpits by the road of a white mill at a crossing, of carved yews before black timbered inns, of a starling that has learned the curlew's call perched on a cottage roof, of abelais all rough silver with opening leaf shivering along the grass-bordered evening road, of two or three big oaks in a meadow corner, and in their shadow unblemished parsley and grasses bowed as if rushing in the wind. At an indoor stands a young labourer, tall and straight but loosely made, his nose even and small, his eyes blue and deep-set, his lips like those of Antius, his face ruddy and rough-grained, his hair short and brown and crisp upon his fair round head, his neck bound by a voluminous scarf with alternate lozenges of crimson and deep green divided by white lines, that is, gathered beneath his chin by a brass ring, and thence flows down under his blue coat, his trousers of grey cord dirty and patched with drab to a weathered stone colour, fitting almost tightly to his large thighs and calves and reaching not too near to his small but heavily shod feet. A prince, a slave. He is twenty, unmarried, sober, honest, and noble animal. He goes into a cottage that stands worn and old and without a right angle in its timbers or its thatch any more than its apple trees and solitary quints, which all but hide the lilac, a messed honesty of the little garden. This is a house. I almost said this is a man that looked upon England when it could move men to such songs as Come, live with me, and be my love, or Hey down, a down, did Diane sing, amongst her virgins sitting, The love there is no vainer thing, for maidens most unfitting, And so think I with down, down, dairy. In a moment or less he goes under the porch. I seem to see that England, that swan's nest, that island which a man's heart was not too big to love utterly. But now, what with Great Britain, the British Empire, Britons, Britishers, and the English-speaking world, the choice offered to whomsoever would be patriotic is embarrassing. And he is fortunate. You can find an ideal England of the past, the present and the future to worship, and embody in its in his native fields and water or his garden as in a graven image. The round, unending downs are close ahead, and upon the nearest hill a windmill, besides a huge scoop in the chalk, a troop of elms below, and then low hedged fields of grass and wheat. The farms are those of the downland. One stands at the end of the elm troop the swerves and clusters about its tiled roof, grey cliff of chimney stack, and many gables. The stables with newer tiles, the huge slope of the barn, the low mossy cart lodge, and its wheels and grounded shafts, the pale straw stacks, and the dark hayricks with leaning ladders. A hundred sheep bells rush by with the music of the hills in the wind. The larks are singing, as if they never could have done by nightfall. It is now the hour of sunset, and windy, 
All the sky is soft and dark grey clouded, except where the sun, just visible and throbbing in its own light, looks through a bright window in the west with a glow. Exactly under the sun the grass and wheat is full both of the pure effulgence and of the southwest wind, rippling and glittering. There is no sun for anything else save the water. North of the sun, and out of its purr, lies a lush meadow. Beyond it, a flat marshland cut by several curves of bright water. Above that, a dark church on a wooded mound. And then three shadowy swoops of down, ending at a spire among trees. Southwest, the jagged, ridgy cluster of a hillside town, a mill and a castle, stand dark and lucid, and behind them the mere lines of still more distant downs. End of Sussex from the South Country by Edward Thomas. This recording is in the public domain. Book Lover and His Books by Harry Lyman Koopman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thick Paper and Thin Sir Hiram Maxim, The Knight from Maine, prophecies that we shall change our religion 20 times in the next 20,000 years. In the last 2,000 years, we have changed our book material twice from papyrus to parchment, and from parchment to paper, with the consequent change of the book form from the roll to the codex. Shall we therefore change our book material 20 times in the next 20,000 years? Only time itself can tell. But for 500 years, the book has never been in such unstable equilibrium as at present. The proverb, a book's a book, has never possessed so little definite meaning. This condition applies chiefly to the paper, but as this changes, the binding will also change from its present costly and impermanent character to something at once cheaper and more durable. The changes in modern paper have worked in two opposite directions, represented on the one hand by Oxford India paper, with its miraculous thinness, opacity, and lightness, and on the other hand by papers that, while also remarkably light, offer, as in a sample book expresses it, excellent bulk. For instance, 272 pages to an inch as against 1,500 to an inch of Oxford India paper. The contrasted effects of these two types of material upon the book as a mechanical product are well worth the consideration of all who are engaged in the making of books. Some of these results are surprising. What, for instance, could be more illogical than to make a book any thicker than strength and convenience require? Yet one has only to step out into the markets where books and buyers meet, to find a real demand for this excess of bulk. Though illogical, the demand for size in books is profoundly psychological and goes back to the most primitive instincts of human nature. The first of all organs in biological development, the stomach, will not do its work properly unless it has quantity as well as quality to deal with. So the eye has established a certain sense of relationship between size and value. And every publisher knows that in printing, from a given plates, he can get twice as much for the book at a trifling excess of cost if he uses thicker paper and gives wider margins. That all publishers do not follow these lines is due to the fact that other elements enter into the total field of book selling besides quantity, the chief of which is cost, and another of which, growing in importance, is compactness. But it is safe to say that to the buyer who is not, for the moment at least, counting the cost, mere bulk gives as great an appeal as any single element of attractiveness in the sum total of a book. This attraction of bulk receives a striking increase if it is associated with lightness. The customer who takes up a large book and suddenly finds it light to hold receives a pleasurable shock which goes far towards making him a purchaser. He seems not to ask or care whether he may be getting few pages for his money. The presence of this single agreeable element of lightness at once gives a distinction to the book that appears 
to supplant all other requirements. The purchaser does not realize that the same lightness of volume associated with half the thickness would not seem to him remarkable, though the book would take up only half the room on his shelves. He feels that a modern miracle in defiance of gravitation has been wrought in his favor, and he is willing to pay for the priv privilege of enjoying it. Curiously and somewhat unexpectedly, the results of neither extreme, thick paper nor thin, are wholly satisfactory in the library. The parvenu, who is looking only to, to filling up of his shelves with volumes of impressive size, may find satisfaction in contemplating wide backs. But the scholar and the public librarian will grudge the space which this excellent bulk occupies. One single element in their favor he will be quick to recognize. The better space which they afford for distinct lettering. In a private library, this is collected for use and not for show. The thin paper books are almost an unmixed blessing. They cost little for what they contain. The reduction in thickness is often associated with the reduction in height and width, so that they represent an economy of space all round. A first-rate example of this is furnished by the Oxford India paper Dickens, in 17 volumes printed in large type, yet as bound, occupying a cubical space of only 13 by 7 by 4.5 inches and weighing only 9 pounds. A more startling instance of the, of the novels of Thomas Love Peacock, which are issued in a pretty library edition of 10 volumes, but they are also issued in a single volume, no higher nor wider and only three-fourths of an inch thick. But it is at this point that the public librarian rises to protest. It is all very well, he says, for the private owner to have his literature in this concentrated form, but for himself, how is he to satisfy the eight readers who call for Headlong Hall, Nightmare Abbey, and the rest of Peacock's novels all at once? To be sure, he can buy and catalog eight single-volume sets of the author's works instead of one set in ten volumes, and when he has done this, each reader will be sure to find the particular novel that he is looking for so long as the set remains but the cost will naturally be greater. On the other hand, he welcomes equally with the private buyer the thin paper edition of the Shakespeare Apocrypha, which needs only a third of the space required for the regular edition. Seven sixteenths of an inch as against an inch and five sixteenths. He also looks upon his magazine shelves and sees a volume of the Hibbert Journal with 966 pages in large type occupying the space of a volume of the independent with 1,788 pages by type. Or again, he sees by the side of his thin paper edition of Dickens another on heavy paper occupying more than three times the lineal space with no advantage in clearness of type. By this time, he is ready to vote. In spite of the occasional disability of, of overcompactness for the book material that will put the least strain upon his crowded shelves. A conference with the booksellers shows him that he is not alone in this conclusion. Certain standard works, like the Oxford Book of English First and Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, have almost ceased to be sold in any but the thin paper editions. Then there dawns upon him the vision of a library in which all books that have won their way into recognition shall be clothed in this garb of conciseness, and in which all that aspire to that rank shall follow their example. In short, he sees what he believes to be the book of the future, which will be as different from the book of the present as that it is from the parchment book of the early and middle ages of the Christian era, and as different in binding as it is in material. The realization of this vision will involve, first of all, a readjustment of values on the part of the public, an outgrowing of its childish admiration for bulk, but this change is coming so rapidly under the stress of modern conditions of crowding, especially in city life, as to reduce the vision from its prophetic rank to a case of mere foresight. End of Thick Paper and Thin from The Book Lover and His Books by Harry Lyman Koopman As read by Alan Kelly Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, 1964 The 88th Congress of the United States of America at the Second Session 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Begun and held at the city of Washington on Tuesday, the seventh day of January, one thousand nine hundred and sixty four. Joint resolution to promote the maintenance of international peace and security in Southeast Asia. Whereas naval units of the communist regime in Vietnam, in violation of the principles of the Charter of the United Nations and of international law, have deliberately and repeatedly attacked United States naval vessels lawfully present in international waters, and have thereby created a serious threat to international peace. And whereas these attackers are part of deliberate and systematic campaign of aggression that the communist regime in north vietnam has been waging against its neighbors and the nations joined with them in the collective defense of their freedom and whereas the united states is assisting the peoples of southeast asia to protect their freedom and has no territorial military or political ambitions in that area but desires only that these people should be left in peace to work out their destinies in their own way now therefore be it resolved by the senate and the house of representatives of the united states of america in congress assembled that the congress approves and supports the determination of the president as commander-in-chief to take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against the forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression. Section 2. The United States regards as vital to its national interests and to world peace the maintenance of international peace and security in Southeast Asia. Consonant with the Constitution of the United States, and the charter of the united nations and in accordance with its obligations under the southeast asia collective defense treaty the united states is therefore prepared as the president determines to take all necessary steps including the use of armed force to assist any member or protocol state of the southeast asian collective defense treaty requesting assistance in defense of its freedom Section 3. This resolution shall expire when the President shall determine that the peace and security of the area is reasonably assured by international conditions created by actions of the United Nations or otherwise, except that it may be terminated earlier by concurrent resolution of the Congress. The End of Tonkin Gulf Resolution, 1964, the 88th Congress of the United States of America, at the Second Session. The United States and China, an address before the Congressional Club of Brooklyn, by George F. Seward. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elsie Selwyn The United States and China The question of the evening is international justice as to China. The discussion, if adequate at all, must take a broad range. It involves our duties to China and to the Chinese people and matters that concern them within our home territory. It involves our duties to that people and government in matters that are domestic to them. It involves our duties in the still broader field of the relations of the foreign powers generally to China. The notable matter in the history of our domestic dealings with the Chinese is their exclusion from our territory.
A broad principle recognized by us generally from the beginning of our national existence is the right of the people of other countries to come into our country and to live among us under the equal protection of our laws. This principle was solemnly set forth in an act of Congress approved July 27, 1868, as follows. Whereas the right of expatriation is a natural and inherent right of all people indispensable to the enjoyment of the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and whereas in the recognition of this principle, this government has freely received immigrants from all nations and invested them with the rights of citizenship, and whereas it is claimed that such american citizens with their descendants are subjects of foreign states owing allegiance to the governments thereof and whereas it is necessary to the maintenance of public peace that this claim of foreign allegiance should be promptly and finally disavowed therefore any declaration instruction opinion order or decision of any officer of the united states which denies restricts impairs or questions the right of expatriation is declared inconsistent with the fundamental principles of the republic that the principle involved was not meant to be confined to an interchange of residence between our people and the people of other so-called civilized states is indicated by the terms of a treaty between the United States and China, commonly known as the Burlingame Treaty, that was proclaimed on the 28th of July of the same year. The United States of America and the Emperor of China cordially recognized the inherent and inalienable right of man to change his home and allegiance, and also the mutual advantage of the free migration and emigration of their citizens and subjects respectively, from the one country to the other, for the purposes of curiosity, of trade, or as permanent residence. One might reasonably suppose that a principle of national action set forth so solemnly, and following the line of precedent from the beginning of our national experience, would not be set aside lightly. It was, however, set aside, and I think you will be disposed to believe, when I recite the facts, that it was set aside lightly. As they occurred during my own time as minister to China and shortly thereafter, the narrative will be somewhat personal. In the spring of 1879, barely 11 years after the proclamation of the Burlingame Treaty, I was at home from China on furlough. Feeling concern lest there might be precipitated upon me, as minister to China, some unwelcome duty in regard to the matter of immigration, and particularly because the subject was likely to be a factor in the presidential election then approaching, I prepared and submitted to the Secretary of State a memorandum setting forth my views. In that document, I indicated my belief that the United States ought not to depart from its traditional policy as respects free immigration, but that it could properly seek to forestall and prevent the coming into our country of disfavored classes of the Chinese. To wit, contract laborers, paupers, criminals, diseased persons, and prostitutes. Such limitations, in fact, could not be held to run counter to our traditional policy, nor to our practices thereunder. I submitted further a proposal to make this plan effective by providing, in concert with the Chinese government, for courts of inquest consisting of American and Chinese officials, sitting at proper places in China, before whom should appear persons wishing to come to this country, the duty of the courts being to require proof that no such proposing emigrants would be probably included in either of the objectionable categories stated. I was greatly gratified upon receiving a little later information that the Secretary of State approved my proposals and had requested me to prepare my own instructions on the lines stated. I did prepare such instructions fully and carefully and before I left the country, I received them precisely in the terms in which I had written them, signed by the secretary himself. Upon my return to China, I entered upon the necessary negotiations with the Chinese government, presenting the matter in a series of interviews with the members of the foreign office, and secured their approval, including details as to the constitution of the courts in question. So far, the business had proceeded to my great satisfaction. 
I then sent to Washington a full account of these negotiations, including the notes passed with the Chinese Foreign Office, with a statement that the Chinese government was ready to execute a formal treaty or convention accordingly. It may surprise you to learn that I never received from the State Department at Washington so much even as an acknowledgment of my report. Having done what I was instructed to do, the failure to respond to my report was neither courteous to me nor to the Chinese Foreign Office. A few months later, in the early summer of 1880, I learned that Dr. Angle, president of the University of Michigan, a man of character and distinction, had been appointed my successor as minister to China, and that there had been associated with him, as commissioners to negotiate a treaty to limit Chinese immigration, two other gentlemen of distinction, Mr. Trescott of South Carolina and Mr. Swift of California. In due course, these gentlemen arrived, and I turned over my official charge to Dr. Angle. Before I left Peking, I learned on the best authority that the commissioners had brought no definite instructions, and in fact that the only written instructions held by them were such as might be implied from a letter from the Secretary of State transmitting to them planks of the respective presidential election platforms, Republican and Democratic, disfavoring Chinese immigration. These gentlemen proceeded to make a treaty with China that practically superseded the Burlingame Treaty, and provided that the government of the United States, when and to such extent as it should think desirable, might enact laws to restrict immigration for a period of ten years. Perhaps it ought to be stated, although it bears an unpleasant significance, that when members of the Chinese Foreign Office, at the beginning of these negotiations, asked what was unsatisfactory in the agreements made by them with Mr. Seward, the answer was given that Mr. Seward had no authority to advance his proposals. We must presume, although it puts some strain upon us, that the member of the commission who made this response had not taken the trouble to read the instruction given to me by the State Department that at the moment was on file in the legation archives. The sum of all this is that under political pressure and for purposes of political effect on the Pacific coast, as one may judge, the State Department set aside without hesitation our traditional policy as respects immigration, and the policy set forth specifically as respects Chinese immigration in the Burlingame Treaty. It may not be amiss to say here that the effort, so far as California was concerned, failed of its purpose. That was the campaign of Garfield and Hancock. During the course of the campaign, there was put out on the Pacific coast what was called the Maury Letter. It was written in facsimile form in the handwriting of Mr. Garfield and bore his facsimile signature. The letter was not genuine. It was made up of matter, presumably spoken by Mr. Garfield, indicating friendliness to the principle of free immigration. The result was that the state of California went to Democratic by 32 votes. I shall not enter upon a discussion of the general treatment of Chinese in the United States. It would take too long to recite wrongs to which these patient people have been subjected in our country before and since that treaty was made. Besides, it becomes possible for one to hope that as time passes the old bitter feeling against them and the old fears of an overflowing immigration are dying out, and that sooner or later the question will come up for review under happier auspices. In presenting the matter thus far, I have assumed that you believe that the traditional policy of the United States is consistent with justice. I cannot doubt that you so believe, for I assume further that you are persons who bring all questions to the very highest test. This is a world not of irresponsible tribes or stocks or nationalities, but a world over which presides one who is high in the heavens and who is no respecter of persons. Can it be that the divine being believes that an honest man, be he white or black or yellow, should not be free to go anywhere on his footstool? One might argue about the matter before any other kind of audience, but not here. Our traditional policy runs with the golden rule of the man of Nazareth, and for us who believe in his mission on earth no further argument is needed. It is gratifying to us that our people have been in the main true to our national policy. It is altogether reasonable to believe that they will swing back to this policy as certainly as the magnetic needle, when disturbed, swings back to its pole. I shall now deal with the second question. 
justice to the Chinese people and government as respects things which are domestic to them. The first minister of the United States who took up residence at the imperial capital was Mr. Burlingham. He arrived at Peking in April or May, 1862. He found there Sir Frederick Bruce, a descendant of the Bruce of Bannockburn, minister for Great Britain. Monsieur Berthemi, the French minister, whose mother was American, and General Vlangali, who represented Russia. All these were notable men. Sir Frederick Bruce and Monsieur Berthemi afterwards represented their respective governments at Washington. General Vlangali was a diplomat of wide experience and much ability. Mr. Burlingham addressed himself soon to a study of conditions and to this very question of what justice called for in the relations of the United States and China. He was a man of ardent temperament and of the broadest humanity. A war between England and France and China had just ended, and the Western states were practically at the beginning of a new era in their relations with China. Foreign representatives before the war had been unable to reach Peking, and as a consequence, the gravest misunderstandings of the policies of China on our part, and of our policies on the side of China, were prevalent. Mr. Burlingham conceived the idea that foreign representatives of China should cooperate with one another, in order that just things only might be done toward China and the Chinese, and that just things might be effectively demanded of them. In a dispatch to myself, he formulated this proposition, stating that the other representatives at Peking were in accord with him, and that he wished the consular officers of the United States to live up to it. He himself named this policy the cooperative policy. During the fourteen years of my service at Shanghai, and during my five years' service as minister to Peking, I can say that the cooperative policy was well maintained. During that time, so far as I can remember, no foreign missionary was killed or greatly ill-treated throughout all China. Commerce during that period became greatly extended. The government became more and more impressed with the fact that it ought to regard the foreign states without fear or jealousy, that its best interests would be promoted by peaceful relations, and that reforms in domestic policies must be inaugurated in order to meet the new conditions resulting from an enlarged foreign intercourse. I left China in the fall of 1880, and, so far as I know, the cooperative policy was held to, more or less perfectly, down to the date of the China-Japanese War. I have often thought that if it had been sustained at its best, the foreign representatives of Pekin would have been able to prevent that war. The war came, however, and the results indicated a degree of weakness on the part of China that had not been dreamed of in Western states and perhaps hardly by intelligent foreigners in China. The war, as you will remember, resulted in the conquest by Japan of Chinese territory on the northern side of the Gulf of Pachili. It so happened that this was territory across which, to the Gulf, transit facilities were very much needed by Russia. She had no port open all the year on the Japan Sea. Port Arthur on the Gulf is open throughout the year. After the treaty between China and Japan, by which China ceded to Japan this very territory was signed, Russia interfered with the assistance of France and Germany, and persuaded Japan to accept in lieu of that territory a larger money indemnity in the island of Formosa. A part of this transaction was a secret treaty between China and Russia, under which China agreed to permit Russia to build a railway down to Port Arthur and to lease the port to Russia for a long period of years. Russia, therefore, was securing a quid pro quo for her great service to China. Of course, this treaty came to be a matter of common knowledge, and later on Germany seized the port of Kiaochao on the southeastern shore of the Gulf. This was done, as you will remember, on the pretext that it was in reprisal for the murder of two German missionaries. Still later, France made certain demands for additional territory near her Cochin Chinese boundary, and England acquired the port and fortress of Wei Highway on the southern Gulf coast opposite Port Arthur. You will remember also that Italy made a demand upon China for location in the Chusan archipelago opposite the mouth of the Yangtze. It was a carnival of territorial lust that went on. Following these seizures of Chinese territory, notably the two on the southern side of the Gulf of Pachili, 
there came to the people of that region and to the government at peking a period of unrest which culminated in the boxer outrages i have recited these facts first the peaceful course of relations between eighteen sixty two and the time of the japanese war and the second the grave disturbances that followed the japanese war to indicate to your mind how far the policy of justice initiated by burlingham secured good results and how soon disaster followed after the invasions of the integrity of chinese territory and i propose to leave the discussion of our duty to china on her own soil just here she responded when she was treated with justice she also responded when she was treated with injustice and I know not who could expect that human nature would work differently. I come now to the third division of our subject, our duties in the broad field of foreign relations at large with China. There have been persons who have held that the United States has suddenly come to be a world power. In the time of my service in China, running even through the days of our civil war, I never dreamed that my country was anything other than a world power. I have told you what Mr. Burlingham accomplished as our representative in China. Surely his policy had weight because it was the policy of an American minister. But whether we are today, and doubtless we are, more of a world power than we were at that time, our duties are not different. He sought to maintain the Chinese government to help it build itself up to the demands of a new era. He perhaps never said that a prime duty for us was to secure the absolute recognition of the integrity of Chinese territory. His policy did for a time promote that end as perfectly almost as if it had been enunciated for the purpose. And this should be our policy now. It so happens that there are other nations whose desire, not to say duty, is to maintain the integrity of China. This is notably true of Japan. She ought never to have made war on China. The two great Asiatic states should have stood in firm alliance with one another in order to forestall foreign aggressions. Today, Japan appreciates the mistake that she made and is earnestly seeking to upbuild China. England surely can have no other object in China than to preserve there a free field for her merchants. She is overburdened with foreign possessions already. Moreover, England in these days is far away more under the control of broad humanitarian ideas than she ever was in the past. The United States, Japan, and England, standing together for the preservation of China, would dominate the situation. Russia has secured her outlet to the Gulf. Presumably the destiny of Manchuria is to fall under Russian control. But Manchuria is not a necessary part of China. It could be lost without serious harm to the empire. France has large possessions south of China, and it will take her generations to bring these districts into productive conditions. Germany is commercially ambitious. It was because she expected great things to come of her occupation of Qiaochao that she planted herself there. Away back of Qiaochao, in the provinces of Shanzi and Shenzi, are the finest coal and iron fields in the world. Possession of those fields would make Germany a great factor in the industrial developments of the future. But with the United States, England, and Japan standing firm for the integrity of China, there would be no chance for Germany to obtain control in Shanzi and Shanzi, and no reason why the resources of that district should not be exploited on the right basis by China, with the assistance of foreigners at large. I make a great deal of the proposition that the territorial integrity of China must be maintained. I consider it the question that underlies all other questions. When China has come to feel that her territorial rights are not to be assailed, she will abandon her attitude of distrust and treat the issues arising in the course of foreign relations with the desire to be on good terms with all the world. She will come to see that to be respected she must be strong, and that in order to be strong she must develop the resources of the empire. A great, self-respecting, competent state will then have come into existence. This all has happened to Japan. The people of China are not inferior to those of Japan, and their status among the nations should be vastly greater by reason of the magnitude of their population, territory, and resources. You will ask what this country can do to this end. I have pointed you to what Mr. Burlingham did in his time. His work attracted little attention. It was all done on his own initiative, 
yet it brought good things to china while he lived and for thirty years after he had passed away surely so much done by an individual minister of our country points to what might be done by our national administration working with precision and certainty on a preconceived and cherished policy our government has done much to this end of late when the seizures of chinese territory began mr hay had not gotten his bearings he put out with much confidence and with much acceptance his open-door policy he asked the powers that had seized chinese territory to promise that our trading privileges in such territories should not be abridged this was an impotent policy because the pledges secured were not embodied in treaties and if they had been would stand just so long as the given powers chose to let them stand it fell short of securing the condition under which in all china our commerce could have free course the integrity of all her territory it was not just to the old empire to condone the partition of her territories the course taken i have often thought made us particeps criminis it was as if mr haig had said the old man china is wounded and weak take from him what you like but if you find in his clothes anything that belongs to us spare that surely this was not an attitude of which compatriots of burlingame citizens of the great republic could be proud but mr hay has been finding his bearings the boxer outrages set him thinking he saw and all the world has seen that it was another case of cause and effect the powers had sowed the wind and they were reaping the whirlwind mr hay has learned his lesson and since then as i am fain to believe has seen that if there is to be peace in china and peace between the powers having to do with china the territorial rights of china must be respected i give him unbounded credit for what he has done in this direction it is all very wonderful to me that our statesmen and our people have failed to be properly interested in china and have failed to see that the united states has a great stake in the empire the united states and china are the great states of the pacific ocean they face one another across its waters and in bulk and in resources they are second to no well-centered powers of the earth our people can find their broad markets if we can keep the markets free we cannot afford to allow europe to aggrandize itself on the pacific to our harm the situation inflamed my imagination when as a young man i was resident in china as an old man the ardor of youth all gone it still inflames my imagination it is a case where justice and interest alike demand that the united states should throw all its wonderful influence into the scale in order that the chinese people may be encouraged to work out for themselves a noble destiny china is no sick man the empire waits only for the torch of a great leader her people are intelligent industrious orderly the nation has every element out of which a great leader may build a puissant state america should watch the time and help along the consummation and now in review of all that i have said our conclusions are plain we must deal justly with china in matters domestic to us in matters domestic to them and in matters of international policy but we must do these things with earnest endeavor seeing clearly the ends to which they lead we must stand for china as we did for mexico when the word of an american statesman caused the proudest european potentate of his day to recall his army of conquest we must have faith that the united states is a world power on the side of moral weight rather than because we have soldiers and sailors at command it is a great thing to have magnificent power it is greater to use that power with long forethought for beneficent ends end of the united states and china by george f seward read by elsie selwyn